Thank you. Uh, Sister Keisha will now give us the libation. Hotep family. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We got a long, strong, positive year ahead of us. We got a lot of work to do. I'm happy to see you all in good health and in good spirits. When I traveled these past couple of weeks prior, I sat at the podium of Marcus Messiah Garvey for three days straight just to meditate, to get answers. He is happy with the work that we are doing, but we have so much more to do, Ashe. I went to the warrior mount of Granny Nanny in St. Catherine, Jamaica. She says we have a lot of work to do. Our children are suffering, Ashe. I ask many of our teachers, our ancestors, like George Padmore, E. Sylvester Williams, J.A. Rogers for guidance, to continue to teach me so that I can continue to teach our children, Ashe. As I crossed over the waters, I asked Harriet Tubman and Queen Nzinga to guide me, Ashe. Queen Ya Asantiwa said, we all have a warrior spirit. We just need to pick up our arms and do what we need to do, Ashe. You know, Dr. John Henry Clark, said that with education and forcefulness and nationhood, we can do all that we need to do without help from anyone else, Ashe. Dr. Amos Wilson already left us a blueprint. It's our job to pick up the blueprint and carry it forward, Ashe. Many of our ancestors are touching the shoulders of each and every one of us here today. You did not come here by accident. You didn't come here because you wanted to come. You came here because you, each and every one of us were called here today, Ashe. I sat on a plantation in Jamaica where our ancestors were first dropped off. And I'm going to tell you something. If you sit there quietly, they will talk to you, give you that information. So many had died on the shores coming across to Jamaica. And if you sit at the waterfront, you can hear them. I thought it was a joke when a brother told me, if you sit in a certain angle at a certain time of day, you can actually hear them. Ashe. They said we have a lot of work to do, that our children are suffering. And if we're not willing to fight for them, you should be willing to die for them, Ashe. 
a lot of children were buried on a mound between that road and a long stretch of land that goes direct to Cuba. Nothing but children bodies. If you walk across that road, something happens to you, Ashe. They are waiting for us. They are standing on the shores waiting for us. I'm not telling you what I think, as Alton says. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I've seen. I'm telling you this. We have a lot of work to do. When I went over there, the children are so in awe of us here. You don't realize the power that we have abroad. We are looked upon as gods and goddesses, but we are failing our children because they only pick up the imagery of the, that they see. They know nothing about United African Movement. They know nothing about Sankofa International Academy. They know nothing about CIMOTEP. It is our job to teach them, okay? Lewis Clayton Jones says sometimes you have to step away to regroup. He said that's why one of the reasons he moved to France, so that he can regroup to think. When I went across those shores, I began to regroup to think. I'm willing to pick up arms. Are you, Ashe? We need our own political party. Fannie Lou Hamer told me that. We need it now. Now, Ashe? Ashe. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that when he left, he left four children by his queen. But he left millions of us behind with information that we must pick up and use. Malcolm X understood that you talk direct to power. With information, you cannot be denied, Ashe. So when you hear automatic speak, it's not him. It's Marcus Messiah Garvey. I'm telling you this. If you stood at that podium and looked at that post that they have of him, it is the spitting image of Alton H. Maddox, Ashe. We have many teachers, many many who are still here. The ancestors ask that we give them praise who are still here. So I'm going to do that. Normally during libations, we give praise to the ancestors, those who are gone. But they ask that we give praise to those who are still here, like Ali McLean, Ashe. Alton Maddox, Ashe. Dr. Arthur Lewis, Ashe. And many, many more. We have work to do. So I'm putting a task to each and every one of you tonight. When I direct, as soon as I got back, Monday morning, I started a mailing list. I already have 200 people on that mailing list. Each week we get a program, they will get a program. We have to remember how to touch our people. People in Brownsville, East Bedstar, Crown Heights know nothing about UAM. Some of us live in those neighborhoods. That's our fault, Ashe. People in Harlem, the Bronx, Long Island, Uniondale, wherever, know nothing about Sankofa Academy. That is our fault, Ashe. We have work to do. This is a new year. We putting a brother and a sister with some babies in a White House. We got work to do, Ashe. He can't do it alone. If we leave him to that White House, he's going to do whatever those Jews want him to do. He gave us coded information. It starts from the bottom up. If we were organized, UAM, CMOTAP, New Black Panther Party, we will have all the things that we need, Ashe. So I'm asking all of you to put in work this year. Put in work. Just a minute with the people in your building. You don't even have to buy stamps. Slide it up on the door. They are dying for information. I was at an auditorium with some children. I children from Adam. They gathered around me. 
wanting more and more information what we're doing here. I left this country with 27 books. I came back with none. Ashe? They want the information. Remember, you are God. You are a goddess. You create life. You bring life forth. You carry it forth. You cradle it. Take care of it. Now rise above it. You can do it. Ashe? Ashe. 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 Great. I have some gifts for some of our elders here that I brought back with me because I think it's very important. He's going to remind you, are you buying black first? So my first $20 coin goes to Brother Harold Wilbur. Another road warrior who keeps us informed, whether you want to be informed or not, if you need some information about what Operation Power is doing or what CMO TAP is doing, Brother James Patnar will let you know what it is. Ashe? Get your coin, bro. Get your coin, bro. We got work to do. Our Reverend Dr. Herbert Oliver. You keep Brother Garvey with you on a daily basis, Ashe. Brother Clarence Dudley, who gives so much to our children at the Freedom Retreat. Come and get your $20 coin, brother. Remember, when you spend your money, he's going to remind you to buy black first, Ashe. Thank you very much. Um, we could always expect to get some words of wisdom from Sister Keisha. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, just review with you some of the events that we're having. Um, first, in, your, um, in the program, there's an agenda there will be a UAM membership meeting on January 17th. Now, uh, there's an explanation in this. Uh, and we thought this was a good way to start the new year to talk about health because we is sick. <laughs> and... Um, we need to know how to get ourselves well. Now, Minister Brown um, had to go out of town. He's celebrating his 48th uh, wedding anniversary and his first great grandson. So he's in North Carolina with the family in a celebration and he wanted to be here, he wasn't able to be here, so he did send a letter that he wanted me to read, um, a testimony of his experience with uh, Dr. Lewis. So this is from Minister Brown. He says, uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be with you tonight because I'm in South Carolina celebrating the 48th anniversary of marriage to Lady Viola Brown and the birth of our first great-grandson. However, I want to say something to honor our guest speaker, Dr. Lewis. Early one morning in the summer of 2000, I left home for a walk in the park. It was just a, an early morning um, but it was my hour to get my day rolling. As I turned the corner, I was sprayed by a mist of chemicals from a truck used to kill mosquitoes. This was the city's attack on the West Nile virus. 
A week later, I was taken to the hospital with a severe headache and a temperature of 102. My temperature rose to 104 and stayed there for over a week. Doctors from Downstate Medical Center and the Center for Infectious Disease in Atlanta could not find a reason for my temperature and the headache. About the eighth day, I opened my eyes to see Dr. Lewis beside my bed. My wife and son were there. Um, he told them to juice me at least a quart of greens spinach, broccoli, kale, and other greens, and give it to me every day. He also told them to get other vitamins and nutrients, which I am sure he will discuss with you this evening. Um, four days later, they released me from the hospital with no temperature and no headache. One of the nurses said to my wife, um, what did you give him? Because I know his recovery has nothing to do with us. Um, I should have followed that regimen, but I didn't. Today, I put myself in his care again to help me overcome prostate cancer. I am revealing this condition because it is a condition too many black men suffer from. I hope that he will speak to you concerning the treatment and the remedy for this condition. Finally, let me say that before I knew about my condition, Ollie McLean and Hampton Rookard and myself had planned to honor Dr. Lewis in April of 2009 at Bethany Baptist Church. We will give more information as time goes along, but if ever there was a selfless, committed, dedicated, and deserving physician to be honored, it is Dr. Lewis. There are many testimonies which could be given by this community. Uh, and I am grateful to have been helped by Dr. Lewis. And I think that's a wonderful um, testimony from Minister Brown. I know I've heard Sister McLean talking a lot about what Dr. Lewis has done and how he has helped her. And she would also like to share with you uh, some of her experiences with following Dr. Lewis's um, protocol for keeping yourself well. I'll move playing. He'll tap my family. I am so, so happy to receive Dr. Lewis here in our house tonight. Because if it wasn't for Dr. Lewis, I would not be here right now myself. Many of you know that I just lost my husband. But he was kept alive much longer than any doctor had promised because of our Arthur Lewis, Dr. Arthur Lewis. Ten years ago, I'm going to put my personal business out as well. Ten years ago, I had open heart surgery. I have what they call in other words, my order. And I am a miracle person walking around right now. In Mount Sinai, they say, I am the only person on record that have ever lived through this operation. When I was released from the hospital, Dr. Lewis put me on a protocol that I still maintain today. During the surgery, 
they more or less destroyed another one of my heart valves and I was due to have a second surgery immediately. But I wanted to go home and get my affairs in order first. And I asked Dr. Lewis, should I have it now? Like they're saying, which I didn't want to. But needless to say, I went home. And a year later, my husband panicked when I was a little short of breath one evening. And he called the doctor and they told him to bring me immediately back to Mount Sinai, which he did. When I got there, no one attended me all night long. I was fine. I was just short of breath for a short period of time. But I gave in to my husband and I went anyway. In the morning, the next thing I know, they tell me they're going to prepare me from surgery, for surgery. I said, no, I'm not ready to have the surgery. I'm not in any emergency. If I was in an emergency, would you have allowed me to get out of the bed all night and use the bathroom as I wish and did whatever? No one was watching me. My family came because my husband called them because they all felt that I was in denial of my situation. And I, I'm one person now that can testify as to what Dr. Ben is going through when he said he is now a, a ward of the state because he can't make his own decisions. I wasn't allowed to make my own decision that I will come back with an appointment to get that next surgery. I was not going to have it now. As last resort, about eight o'clock that evening, because they had me scheduled for surgery in the morning, even against my will. I called Dr. Lewis, I was in tears. I said, Dr. Lewis, can you come up here? No, I didn't ask you to come. I said, let me tell you what they're doing to me. They're scheduling surgery for me and I don't think it's necessary at this time. I wanna get my business and my affairs in order before I allow them to do that. I have a son. At that time, he was only 14. I told my doctor, he came back to the hospital. He said, why are you fighting this, Ms. McLean? You know you were supposed to have surgery a year ago. I said, yes, but I lived a year. There's nothing wrong that I couldn't live another month. I'll come back another month from now. So he says, your husband has signed for it. We're going to have the surgery. My husband's begging me to have it. The whole family's in the hospital. So anyway, I says, well, my cousin is coming up here. He got some questions he want to ask you. He said, who is your cousin? I said, he's a doctor. He asked me, what kind of doctor was he? I said, he's an ophthalmologist. He began to laugh. So I said, he's got questions for you. Before you go any further, I called Dr. That's when I called Dr. Lewis. And Dr. Lewis says, Ollie, ask him this, ask him that, ask him another thing. I couldn't even remember what he was saying. But before I knew it, my doctor was there. And I said, my cousin told me to ask you these questions. And he took it as a joke. He wasn't taking me seriously. When I look up, look like five minutes later, who walked into the hospital but Dr. Arthur Lewis and Mary Lewis, okay? My whole body was trembling. When my doctor came in, he began to question Arthur Lewis, but Arthur Lewis began to question him. This is why we must have our icons in our community. People that not only know the medicine, but know how to handle the system. By the time Dr. Lewis asked him, never mind your opinion, medically, why are you determining she needs a surgery in the morning? Remember that, Arthur? He says, when's the last time you've seen her? She had an exam last month? Well, what's the difference in her condition last month as it is today? And this man knew he was in for a ride. When it was all said and done, I walked out of that hospital the next morning, 
I never been so proud of one of our professionals in my life. After I came out of the hospital, Dr. Lewis upgraded my protocol that he put me on. Now, I was supposed to have surgery again in 10 years. Well, this is the 11th year. And because of the protocol that I'm on, there's nothing wrong with my heart. If you see me with anything else going on, there's nothing wrong with my heart. My heart has never been this strong. Dr. Lewis is going to take you through some important information this evening. I want all of you to take out your pen and your pencil because whatever he touch upon, there's somebody in your life that can use this information. And we must pass it on. I don't have anybody do anything to me before I check it first with Dr. Arthur Lewis. He has been tirelessly working in our community, working seven days a week, but he will answer your phone calls. He will tell you to handle yourself, how to handle yourself in these situations. He doesn't put them down, but he tells us what we need as African people. It's a whole different scenario than what they will tell you. We have got to be mindful When we go to these hospitals and these places, they're not looking for us to live and continue. They're looking at us as dollar bills. I don't know if he'll say that, but I'm saying it. When you see the bill for my two heart, um, for my two heart operations, that's what that was all about. Two years ago, was it two years ago? Or about a year or so ago, most of you saw me limping in here. I was going to this doctor, and the doctor said, if I don't go to the hospital immediately, that I have blood clots in my legs. And if I don't go to the hospital immediately, there's no doubt about it, that I'm not going to make it through the next two weeks. I called up Dr. Arthur Lewis. He gave me a simple remedy. I haven't even been back to that doctor since. You remember when it started, Mr. John, I was with you when, I, when that pain first hit me. It almost crippled me. I went down. We were walking together. And after that, I could hardly walk two, two steps without stopping. My legs were killing me. Let me just tell you the remedy, and then I'm going to let it, let it go. Something as simple as one night, the first night, I soaked my feet in garlic. You crush the garlic and warm water and soak my feet. The next night, I alternated to um, peroxide and Epsom salt. And I alternate back and forth. Dr. Lewis told me within a few days, I will see the difference. I saw the difference the very next day. And I haven't even been back to those doctors. He's going to point out the importance of learning how to take care of ourselves. You know, when I was a kid, it was eight of us. My mother didn't have any money to take us to the doctors for every little thing. But she knew how to grow herbs. We had a boil tea for this and boiled, we had all kinds of tea. And I spent 12 years, I never missed a day of school. Okay? I have never missed a day from kindergarten through high school. And we didn't run to the doctor for every little cold and this and that. She knew how to take care of us. We must begin to start practicing 
how to take care of ourselves and our community and run some of these Shylocks and Hawks out of our community because all they're doing is keeping us sick so that they can become millionaires. In fact, Dr. Lewis is the only poor doctor I know of his statue. They're all, the rest are all rich, rich, rich. But as the chairperson of Africans Helping Africans, if you make an extra dollar, it goes right back into our community. This is the man that we're going to listen to this evening. Geneva, I'm going to give it back to you, and you can bring on Dr. Arthur Lewis. We love you. I love you. Okay. Thank you, Sister Ali. Um, I'm sure that you're very anxious to get started. Uh, for those of you who don't know Dr. Lewis, he um, lives in New York. He's in Harlem. He was educated in New York City at uh, City College. He started out as a mathematics and science teacher. And then he went back to medical school and graduated from New York Medical College. Uh, as Ali said, his uh, specialty is ophthalmology, but he also specializes in, uh, I guess what we would call alternative medicine is the name we give it now. Uh, but it's the medicine that heals. And in uh, examining, um, we were looking at some health issues for this program. We were looking at the things that we are basically dying from. And um, kidney disease, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, those are among the things that black people are dying from. Infant mortality, could you believe in these United States? I mean, we're the world leader in everything, and yet the rate of infant mortality among blacks is very high, almost twice that of the white population. So that's the child dying either at birth or before they reach a year old. So that's really serious. And um, I think we should listen carefully. Uh, let's give a drum roll to bring on our Dr. Arthur Lewis and let's hear the information that he's going to give us. Okay. Okay. I would like to extend my appreciation for you giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you. And as in the African tradition, I have to request the elder, most elder here, to give me permission to speak and continue. Do I have it? Okay. What I would like to do at this particular point is to distribute to the audience a handout. Now, in the handout, there's only 18 handouts, so at this point, we would have to distribute it in such a way that one individual will take it, and then the second individual next to that person will read with it, so that gives us at least 36 uh, people that will be able to read what we have in the handout. I'm, we're going to distribute it in a minute. What, there are many ways to present material. And one of the ways, obviously, is to speak to you. But we're going to try to do it in at least two or three ways. We have an overhead projector. We have some transparents here. And in these transparents, it will illustrate what's in the package. The package contains um, 14 pages. There's 11 pages of information. And the information that's in this package is basically what's going to be on a transparent. And at the end of the handout is a three-page on um, protocol for high blood pressure, diabetes, and a number of other things here. And basically what we 
what I'm going to attempt to do in the short period of time that we have is to try to present to you a method by which you should be able to start trying to take care of your health for the simple reason that that's the most important thing you have is your health. Once when you wake up in the morning and you're alive and you made it for that day, the next thing is your health. And you have to learn how to take care of your health. The system that we're living in is such that they withhold information from you so that you will not be able to take care of yourself, so that you can get sick because of the commercial aspect of it. In this country, they just analyzed the health budget for the United States, and it was $2.2 trillion was spent in this country in the year 2007, and I believe 2008 is going to be 2.7 trillion. It's the largest budget in the expenditures of the United States government, about 17%. So despite the fact that this, these amount of monies are being spent, you have at least half of the population with no insurance, health insurance at all. Then you have, so they say there's 300 million people here. There's probably 100, 150 million people who have no health insurance. They keep using the number of 44 million, but it's much higher than that. Of the other half of the population that has what they call health insurance, 100, 150 million, most of that health insurance is, is inadequate to meet your needs. Now, if you take Medicare for the elderly above 65, well, that automatically comes with your Social Security. That's something that you earned and paid for. If you take away that portion of the health care, Medicare, that you earned and paid for 65 and older, probably the percentage of people without health insurance, the remaining population would probably be about 60 or 70 percent. So what you have to understand is that you're living in a capitalistic society. And in a capitalistic society, things are done in such a manner that it's, it's, it's like uh, European feudalism. You're, in, you're living in the United States of America. This country was founded by Englishmen, and every one of the colonies were a corporation. And that same type of feudalism where the masses in Europe would work and the king or the duke or the duchess would take all of the benefits. It's the same thing in the United States of America. The masses of people work and is basically structured in such a way that the wealth that is created by the masses is then redistributed to a handful of people you call CFOs and stockholders and others like that. And medical care is no different than any other type of institution in the United States that you're familiar with. So you have to understand that background as to why it is that so many people in the United States do not have a piece of paper they call health care, and why so many people in the United States are sick, or what you consider sick. Those chronic conditions that were mentioned here, like diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney problems, they're just a natural outgrowth of the way we live. So in trying to encompass, in a short period of time, the concept of health, the best I could do was to say to you there are basically four things that I found out, that you have to deal with your lifestyle as one. Your belief system is the second, your environment is the third, and your community is the fourth. These are the types, these four areas you have to have function at its highest level in order for you to be healthy, what you call healthy. And by that I mean, and we will explore it in a few minutes through the slides and the handouts, lifestyle is critical to your health. Your environment is critical to your health, and you will see why and how the environment plays into your health. Your belief system is critical because that's how we've been conditioned so that when you get sick, the choices that you make. And I would like to thank Brother Clemson Brown for giving me that type of accolade and Sister Ollie. And it reflects on me positively what 
it is, it is something that I was able to impart upon them. There's nothing magic about what I'm doing. It's that it's utilizing a method of trying to help you keep healthy that is totally outside of the way medicine is practiced in the country. So when I or any of the other individuals function with you in this way to give you some knowledge that will help you to relieve or prevent certain conditions, and you say, well, Dr. Lewis and others, look how good they're doing. And that is true, but part of it has to do with what we are saying, those of us who try to practice the way I do, when you compare that to the way the medical profession is practiced, it makes us even look better. Because as you explore the medical profession, you will see the way it is structured. So what I would like uh, someone to do is to come to this table. There are 18 of these folders. I'd like you to, in some equitable way, the, uh, in that package. You see the transparents right there? Remove the transparents. And there's 18. So that means if you could somehow distribute those some kind of equal way so that individuals will be able to at least read along. What I'm going to attempt to do is I have the material and the way we're going to, I'm going to present it in such a way because I want you to walk away with this material so you have something to reread and reference. That's number one, why we gave it. I'm going to show you some transparency. And in the con and showing the transparency, I'm going to read from the material that I have in my hand that you will get. The purpose of reading the material, which I could easily lecture to you, the material, because I know the material. But the reason that I'm reading it is because I want you to hear what's in here, those who don't have the handouts, and those who may get a video or DVD, I want them to hear what is said because they don't have it in their hand. Of the 11 pages, as we present the transparency, I will present the material. And at the end of each presentation, there will be about 11 short presentations because that's 11 sheets here. After a particular presentation, I will then ask for you to have questions and answers. The reason that I would like questions after each presentation is because we find that that is, at that time, that's how you can get the most information about the specific condition that is presented. If I present all of the material at once, many of the concepts and ideas are going to be missed. Now, it's 20 minutes tonight. What time are we stopping? So I'll get an idea of the time period on how deep we can go into each session. About 10? Okay, so we have approximately an hour and 15 minutes, which we can do it in an hour and 15 minutes. Now, I asked Holly McLean whether or not I can hand out this sheet. And those who have it will have it, and those I will assume will photocopy it and distribute it. Even though this is health, what I wanted to do was to just bring you a photocopy that came out of the Carib News, July 9th, 2009. And it says Obama, excuse me, 2008. They said Obama won't be the first black president. So the reason that I just introduced this is, is that as we go through this presentation on health, we're going to try to dispel some misconceptions you may have or we'll try to give you information that may be helpful. So we're starting it out with the best that we can do as it relates to trying to give you accurate information. And so we started only here with Obama. It will not be the first black president so that we could begin to understand the importance of whatever we deal with, we try to be as accurate as possible. Now, according to the article, J.A. Rogers and other African historians and white historians, based upon the way they classify people as black, like your Adam Clayton Powells and others, there were six presidents who 
according to the classification in the United States, would be considered black or African-based. And in the article, they will indicate it to you. And it happened to be uh, Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln, Coolidge, Harding, Eisenhower, and now Obama. So he will be not the first, but the seventh and only the darkest of the, them based upon that. Okay. What we're going to do first is put in the first transparent and the first transparent and the second transparent, you will be able to read very well because it's in large print. So I'm going to read from that and you'll be able to see. I'm going to put up the subsequent transparents, which are not as legible because the writing is much smaller. Let's plug it in first. And the, and the purpose, again, as we said, is to let those who don't have the handout and those who can't read it to see the material. And basically what we're going to do is follow those four tenets. The first, the 11 pages, and we say we're going to deal with lifestyle, then belief system, then the environment, and then community. Now, if we could bring the lights down a little bit, and again, for those who can't read it, there's a handout here, and I will read it for you because I want you to hear what they have to say rather than me having the knowledge and interpreting it in my words. Basically what this is, it's a uh, photocopy of a news, Newsday article and it's from January 30, 2007 and it says Okinawans grow fat on U.S. diet. So these two sheets that we're going to read is to illustrate to you the effect of your lifestyle, how dramatically it has on your health. And so we use this study. Okinawa is a chain of islands in the Pacific, which is southern to the main islands of Japan. Japan conquered these islands, but the people who live on these islands are people who look just like me and you. Like most people in the South Pacific look just like this audience. So Okinawa is then considered a part of Japan, but they're not, they're not Japanese people. They're people who live in the Pacific. I've worked and lived in the uh, Pacific, so I can just give you that illustration. And the reason we, or I am presenting this to you in this way is because when I went to medical school, uh, two years, the first two years is uh, sciences, and the second two years you walk around the hospital. And then I realized that when we got our MD degree, that the, what we had to do for scholarship was nowhere near as intense as the average person who takes a master's degree or a PhD degree. Once you get past the first two years of medical school, if you don't give them any trouble, you get your paper. So that's the first thing that I realized, that our education wasn't as intensive as we thought. Then graduating, you go into the hospitals, I trained at Brooklyn Jewish, basically was my main training in surgery and ophthalmology. My specialty is ophthalmology and emergency medicine. I've done 20 years of emergency medicine in Kings County and most of the big hospitals in New York and New Jersey, so I have a double specialty. And it wasn't until I began to travel outside the United States to see how other people conducted their medicine and their health care. Then I realized that I was, like most medical students in the United States, cheated out of an education. You spend four years in the medical school and you, you, and you uh, pay all this money. Then when you get out, you realize, wait now, we haven't been taught anything about environmental medicine. We haven't been taught anything about preventive medicine. We haven't been taught anything about nutrition. We haven't taught anything about spirituality. So then when you, after going through the system, only when you step out do you realize how your education, you were poorly educated. So the average physician who graduated in the United States thinks he or she knows everything. And until they get out, you realize how much you really don't know. So right from the third year 
which is your first clinical year, in the fourth year, you're in the hospital, and we see medical conditions, and you're told this is how you treat them, and all you treat them with is drugs and surgery and radiation. There's no other way that you treat the condition. So when you hear Brother Clemson and Sister Ali tell you the so-called magic that I work, what we simply did was say, look, as I told Brother Clemson, I think at that time he had double pneumonia. He was ready to write out the will. So I said to him, this is what you're going to do. If you want to survive this thing, you must let your immune system fight the battle. If your immune system cannot fight off whatever they put on you, you're gone. If your immune system can be built up enough to fight whatever is going on, you'll make it. So as he, she, Brother Clemson indicated, so they got all the juices, they got all of the herbs intensively, and basically what happened was we poured in the nutrients and other things that your immune system needs to protect you, and that's what saved them. Not any magic on my part, because we used the immune system. And how did I come to that understanding? When I left the United States of America and then saw how other people did medicine, treatments and stuff, and then I came back and said, you know, this is, this, is, this is barbaric medicine, the way it's practiced here. Now, part of that, I won't say part of it, it's all due to money. Medicine in the United States is first economic, second political, and third health. The considerations are basically structured for what is the most money for the doctor, the hospital, the pharmaceutical. So therefore, the treatment modalities that they extend to you is such that in many cases, or most doesn't help you. Now you ask why. One reason is because the way the doctors have been trained here, they really don't understand or believe that nutrition is critical for your health. They've never been taught it. They've been taught that you, know, you, get, your, you get your MD degree, put some time in the hospital, you and your friends get cozy, your friends get your associate professor, you walk around and you actually think that what you are doing is the only way to do it. So when you approach it in a different manner to say, no, nutrition can do it, uh, exercise can do it, they laugh at you. They laugh at you only because they were trained in a manner that doesn't include that and that does not include the modality that they have been taught. Now, so let's read this with that background. It says, Okinawans once boasted more centenarians, individuals who live to be 100, than anywhere else in the world. That is true, but, you know, they could go around the world. Up in Levitman Game gave one Vanuatu where my wife is part of the village. She said they got one or two people there, 150 years old. Documented. Now, now the island has the highest prevalence of obesity in Japan. Life expectancy is falling rapidly. The culprit, six decades of U.S. influence. Your, your lifestyle. Now, what has happened was, okay, we're going. Growing up in post-war Okinawa alongside U.S. military largest overseas bases, Residents develop a bigger appetite for American-style barbecue, hamburgers, sodas than the fish and vegetable that sustained prior generation. So now they're beginning to see, how, how do these people live? And now that the U.S. base has been there 35 years, they now have a comparison to see what is the effect of a person's health when you move from one lifestyle to another lifestyle. And most of us living in the United States live just like these individuals around the bases, which is not our fault. The, my, he's quote, my body intrinsically craves for succulent meat, said this individual during a hospital visit. He's 46 years old. Where her blood sugar level is treated monthly to monitor a type 2 diabetes that impairs her vision and increases the risk of heart disease. Diabetes affects 8.2% of Okinawans and only 5% of the Japanese nationals. On Okinawa, almost half of the men and a quarter of the women are either overweight or obese. In contrast, a quarter of the 130 million people in Japan fall in either category. The U.S. military has about 36,000 people based on Okinawa. 
Experts blame servicemen for bringing burgers, french fries, canned meats to the islands earlier than to the rest of Japan. This individual recalls her mother serving fried vegetables with Spam, regular meals at dinner, and American-style barbecue on the beach. Anyway, before 1945, Okinawans consumed, now you'll see what made them live such a long period of time. This is what the Okinawans who, do not, who live in Okinawa but do not eat like the Americans, the way they ate before. Now let's compare the Okinawans who stuck with their original way of life. Before 1945, Okinawans consumed mostly fish, fresh fish, soybean, which would be protein organically grown with no pesticides, seaweed, seaweed is protein with all kinds of minerals that you need, vegetables, I'm pretty sure organic, multiple vegetables, nothing in the can, and pork. In the Pacific, they eat pork, but they don't eat it every day. They eat it during ceremonies and weddings and deaths and things like that. The diet was rich in antioxidants. Antioxidants are chemicals that are in your foods, vitamins and others, that protect your cells from damage. Omega-3, omega-3 is a type of a fatty acid that your body needs to burn for energy and to cut down inflammation. Most of us eat omega-6s and 9, vegetable oil and others, which is not very good for the body. Proteins that help protect against Vascular disease, that's, there's where your heart condition comes in, your blood vessels come in, such as stroke, heart attack, and low the risk of cancer, according to this study in Japan, Japan. Those who retain the traditional diet are healthier than their peers. The equivalent for us was those of us who were fortunate enough to be in the south of the United States, living in fresh air, fresh water, didn't have access to much meat, you ate fish, you were outside breathing fresh air, no polluted water, no processed food, and we lived longer and healthier when we were in the South. Take away the lynching and the killing, we made it pretty good. That, that was the big one. Those who retain their traditional diet are healthier than their peers with an average life expectancy of 86 for the women and 78 for the men. Okinawan elders have one-fifth the heart disease. Now you begin to see the difference between those chronic conditions that we suffer from, that they have documented just one person living one type of lifestyle, another person eating and living another type of lifestyle. The life expectancy of 78 for men. Okinawan elders have one-fifth the heart disease just on the diet. A quarter of the breast and prostate cancers and one-third of the dementia of Americans of the same age according to the study. So what's killing us off is the lifestyle. That's the first problem that we have here. This individual, Sushi Magawi, 100, enjoys stroll along the garden. She's still walking and working in her garden. No wheelchairs and walkers. She often invites friends to her home to share a lunch of stewed pork leg, potato, rice, and red beans. The rice and beans, there it goes again. Not the canned starches that you pick. The secret of longevity is to eat three proper meals a day, she indicates. Magdi, whose grandmother also reached 100, and the 740 other centenarians Okinawa represent a disappearing generation, said this individual. So we put in these two articles so that you will see critically how important just diet alone is. And they know that all groups immigrating into the United States, regardless of where they come from, the continent of Africa, where they're in the rural areas, parts of Europe, Japan, when any group immigrates into the United States, within 10 years that group has the same high incidence of cancer heart disease, etc. So the, these, these first two pages, which you can photocopy and bring to others, illustrates the critical nature of what it means to have good food. So the more we can get away from anything processed, so what does it mean? You have to eat the best way you can fresh vegetables. 
But again, we have a problem because most vegetables in the United States are sprayed with at least five pesticides. So that's why you have to go organic. But then organic is, is expensive. So there's a way you can get around that, and we'll, I'll indicate it to you as we end up. You gotta cut down the meats because it's the animal fats in the meats. Nothing against pork or beef as a religious or, or uh, uh, any other way. It's just that the animal fats are the major culprits in blocking up your vessels with heart disease. So you gotta cut down your meats. You have to stay with your fresh vegetables and your beans and things like that. Right back to basic. The second article is this article we put up here. And again, I apologize for the markings, it was done for another presentation. They converted it into the clear slide and they forgot to use the, the photocopies that didn't have it. But what it's supposed to show from the New York Times, September 13, 2006, two young women who were supposed to be Indians in India eating at a bakery. And I put in this article to quickly show you the, the direct correlation between why you're so diabetic in this society. Even though the doctor keeps telling you it's your genes, even if you had a gene for diabetes, the gene cannot express into diabetes unless in the environmental conditions are present to make it a bit expressed. So I took this out. Rather than digging through the, all of these extensive uh, scientific studies, just to show you they know what the cause of diabetes. In treating you when you confront your medical doctor, what's critical for him or her to steer you in the direction of a treatment is your ignorance. If you don't know, they'll tell you this is the way to go. Now, it says here, and I'm going to read again. New York Times, July 13, 2006. It says a, a, taste, a taste for sweets like those in the bakery and the growing popularity and of processed food are contributing to diabetes in India. So they're telling you right away, it's the processed foods and the sugar. They talk about any genes. So in India, there are many ways to understand diabetes in this choking city of automobiles and software companies where the disease seems is, is very commonplace. We go down to the second line. Type 2 diabetes is engulfing India. Here, juxtaposition alongside the, the, the stick thin poverty. Malaria and AIDS, the number of diabetics now total 35 million and counting. Type 2 diabetes, a disease of high blood sugar brought on by obesity. There's reasons why obesity, because when you're obese, automatically in this society, you're, you're loaded with toxins. And toxins destroy your pancreas. Your pancreas is an organ that produces the insulin that helps to push the sugar into the cell. When you are living in this society and you're eating so many toxins that the toxins destroy your pancreas, therefore you can't produce insulin for it. So there's where the obesity connection comes in. It isn't, oh, well, you're just fat and that's what it is. That has nothing to do with it. There's a correlation. So they're telling you now why diabetes is skyrocketing in India. Type 2 diabetes is a disease of high blood sugar brought on by obesity, inactivity, and genes often culminating in blindness, and they go on. Diabetes, unfortunately, is the price you pay for progress, said this particular doctor, managing director of the hospital in India. For decades, type 2 diabetes has been the rich man's burden, a problem for industrialized countries to solve. But as the sugar disease, as it is often called, has penetrated the United States and other developed nations, it has also trespassed deeply into more populous developing countries. So diabetes is beginning to skyrocket in developing countries. What's the connection? In Italy or Germany or Japan, diabetes is on the rise. In Bahrain, in Cambodia, Mexico, where industrialization and Western food habits have taken hold. It is rising. Diabetes does not convey the ghastly disease of AIDS or other killers, but more people worldwide now die from the chronic diseases that diabetes, and it goes on. And the World Health Organization expect that more, more than 350 million 
diabetes, diabetics projected in 2020. Three fourths in the third world. So diabetes is a condition which is related directly to what you eat. Now, before we go on to the second part, which we just gave the little lifestyle, we're going to go on to the environmental portion to give you. Do you have any questions that you want to ask now to give more specific before we move on? On the condition of lifestyle or diabetes. Yes. The thing is that when you're in the system, you only know what, you, is what they teach you. It's only when you leave it that you see there's a difference, and then you start questioning the difference. Um, what we'll have to do, because we weren't aware that we were going to be doing the question and answer. So, uh, Dr. Lewis, could you repeat? I'll fit it all in. Okay. Repeat, just repeat the question. You want the, the question, I believe, he indicated, if I correct me, when did you begin to get an idea that something was up? Is that just just, just to the question? What, right. what, no, what happened is you read from the books and you learn from your patients. And as you learn from the patient, you keep treating them and treating them, and then you begin to say something is wrong. I was treating an elderly woman one time for glaucoma. I gave her drops. When you give certain drops for glaucoma, it goes in the eyes, it comes down to the nasal lacrimal sac, and goes into your nose, you know when you cry. And she said, every time this happened, which I knew it, it caused my heart to race. So she said, if you can't do something other than that, I'm not taking it. So then I began to say, you know, whether it's for ophthalmology, emergency medicine, you have to do something different than the way we've been taught. So that's the first thing I said, something is wrong. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't have anything to really compare. Then when I left to go overseas to start working in other places, then the things begin to click. Okay, any other questions before we get to the environmental? Yes. Got to be quick and, and, and let everybody hear it. Okay, I'll answer that question when we get two thirds in. The question will be there. One other question before we go on to the environment. Yes. Let's go on. When you get a cold, can you get rid of the cold? Diabetes is essentially the same thing. If you, there are two types, like what they call juvenile diabetic and adult. Juvenile diabetics are those individuals usually when they're young, they don't produce any insulin or not enough, so they need to take the insulin substitute. The vast majority of individuals here or in the world will develop adult onset diabetes. That means diabetes at, when you're an adult, 35, 40, or 50. And all it means is that your body has difficulty handling the sugar. So when you eat, the insulin is supposed to push the sugar into the cell. But the insulin is not able to push the, insulin, the sugar into the cell adequately. So therefore, the sugar rises in your blood vessels, rises in your bloodstream. One of the ways you easily take any person who's diabetic and make them non-diabetic is the reason that 
the quick answer is the reason that your insulin doesn't work well enough to push the sugar into the cell, therefore it stays in the bloodstream, is because the insulin molecule doesn't work well. One of the reasons why the insulin molecule doesn't work well, most diabetics or many are deficient in chromium. When you give people chromium, chromium picolinate, you make the insulin molecule work more efficiently, and then it pushes it in. When you get them on an exercise program, it makes the insulin molecule work more efficiently, it pushes it in. When you get people to use green vegetables, you know, like these green powders, and eat a lot of vegetables, any green chlorophyll keeps the blood alkaline, it makes the insulin work that much more efficiently. So most adult onset diabetics is that the, you make the insulin, but it doesn't work very well. When you make certain dietary changes and other changes, you get that insulin to work, knock it right out. But if you're a physician and a third of your business is diabetes, you don't go into the education and understanding part. Quick, then we go on. The reason because diabetes is a very important question. Continue, yes. That's a whole nother question. We'll get to that. Okay, now we're going to get to the envir environment, and I'll take your question after the environment. I put in this article, it's a short article, even though you have 11 pages, they go quick because there's only a small amount of information that I want to use on it just to illustrate it. It shows a chicken, and it said, dinner is drug free. And it says here, most of the billions of chickens, pigs, and other animals raised for food each year receives antibiotic in their feed. They grow fast and stay healthier, but there's a huge potential problem. Basically, the article was put in just to show you that when they raise animals in this country, they give them antibiotics. You eat these antibiotics. Certain percentage of the, the bacteria in the environment and in your intestinal tract become resistant. So you eating chicken and you don't know you're eating tetracycline, uh, erythromycin, and all these antibiotics. Then when you really get sick, and you need it, the drugs don't work because the population has built up resistance. That's one. Now, the second article below, just to, to clue you into the environment, and the purpose behind it is to, when we say to you, filter your water. This is the reason why we want you to filter water. It isn't any academic thing that I feel is better. Now, this is called government may broaden the regulation of sewage sludge. You know, when they... Uh, you get the sewage and the treatment and they treat the water and they put it in the river and the solid part. And so this article pretty much says that the government is going to regulate 15 of the chemicals. But over here in the second paragraph it says the 15 chemicals at issue that's in the sewage sludge are acetone, anthracite, barium, beryllium, carbon disulfide, 5 fluoro diapine, methyl alpha ketone. All of these chemicals Stuff that they go in your gas station and, and all of these factories dumping in the water. All are present in 5.6 million tons or so of sewage sludge used or disposed of in the United States each year. 60% of which goes on fertilizers. They take the sewage sludge with all of the chemicals in it, toxins, viruses, bacteria, human waste, they dry it out, they put a little lime on it, and put it on your vegetables. So you, when you go in the store, you don't know what part of your vegetables are grown with this sludge. So the two reasons why we ask you to eat fresh vegetables is for the nutrient value. Then the problem with the fresh vegetables is you got toxins on it, pesticides, and sewage sludge. So I'll tell you why I don't eat fresh vegetables in these places, and, and we'll go to that. So you eat fresh vegetables, understanding that they have sewage sludge on it with all the toxins, and they have pesticides. Then you go to organic, but then we can't afford the organic. So there's something else we'll do. We'll let you know at the end. Now we go to the next Hopefully, we will duplicate it for everyone. Is an is a article that you do not have on the slide. But I 
just put it in. I have told, none, told a lot of these articles, but I put it in here from the Daily Challenge, January 29, 2007. The biggest threat to drinking water is rust. Now, there are so many other things in drinking water now. All of those toxins that we just read is in the drinking water. All of the, uh, they're now finding medicines from the hospital in the drinking water. The drinking water is loaded with all kinds of uh, toxins. But they, I use the word rust to show you iron. So we always say to a person, so when we ask somebody a protocol, a protocol basically is things we, a system of things we put together to say you should do these things. And one of the things we ask you is you got to filter your water. When you buy bottled water, you don't know where it came from. From the sink, plastics from the bottle leaches in. So the best way to get your water is if you can afford the $150 or $60 internet, you buy your water filter. That's the only way you can halfway know you're getting fresh water. So when we say to you, get you a water filter, that's the reason to stop these toxins from coming in. When we say eat organic, eat vegetables, then eat organic, then go to the next stage if you can't afford it. So these are the clues. And all of what you're doing now is allowing the body to take care of itself. Every tissue of your body has what they call stem cells or mother cells or grandmother cells or great-grandmother cells because every organ in your body is constantly replacing itself. In other words, the liver you have now, you didn't have that liver 400 days ago. So in order for your body to make new heart cells, new brain cells, new liver cells, the body is constantly making new cells. In order for the body to replace a dying and dead cell, if you are giving it what it needs, the nutrients, the next cell that is going to be produced is going to be healthy and strong. If you don't give it to them, the next cell is going to be not healthy. And what happened with Clemson was, whatever he had, by Massively introducing into his body through his mouth, through liquids. You poured in the nutrients, the vitamins, the, the chemicals that his immune system needed to fight off what it is. That's what all you did. It is your immune system is the most important system to keep you alive and healthy. Because that's what's been doing it all of these years. So that's the critical part. So we say to you, and this is the protocol we're giving to you. You filter your water. You eat vegetables. You eat fresh vegetables. You eat organic vegetables if you can. Now, we're going to go to the next sheet here. Which, no, that one, brother, you can leave it. Which is in the, this corner here. And this is a sheet that I put together, but we're not going to go through it. What it does, the point that I want of this is, is to uh, show you here. The way they raise animals, for those who eat meat, beef, chicken, pork, lamb, shrimp, and fish. They call farm shrimp and farm fish. Because it's a capitalist system and they want to make money, eating meat is one of the worst ways to conserve your food because for every pound of meat, you have to feed that animal 10 pounds of protein. So you're taking 10 pounds of some protein, give it to the animal, and you get one pound of protein meat. So if you're in Africa or any place else and you want your people to eat, you don't, you don't raise animals. You eat the food yourself. Anyhow, to make the animal grow fast, and I use chicken as an example, they take a chicken. Now, you want the chicken to grow as rapidly as possible. So what they do, and this happens to all of the meats here, what they do is the animal that you eat, the animal has hormones. Hormones are chemicals that your body produces to regulate the whole body, like your thyroid hormone and your, and your estrogen and your growth hormone. These are hormones that the body uses to regulate. Basically, what we're doing is giving you information. When you have the information, then you can go. That's why when I ask individuals to do a protocol after sitting with them and talking and giving information, I say, you must do it. 
You, I told you where to go, how to go, what's the rationale. You must do it yourself. Those who do it, they're good. The individuals who don't follow it, they, they're no good. So you, you have to learn this material just like I and everybody else learned it. And that's what the doctor doesn't want you to do. He wants to make the decision. They don't want you to be self-empowered or be educated. That's the key. So now you got the chicken. Now to make the chicken grow fast, they give them growth hormone. Growth hormone is carcinogenic. It causes cancer. So in that chicken, you got growth hormone. They also give the chicken antibiotic because when you stick them together, they get sick. Disease would be rampant, so they feed them antibiotics. So they give them antibiotics. They give them growth hormone to make them grow faster. And they give them estrogen. Estrogen is one of the hormones that's in your body. Excess estrogen is carcinogenic. Cancer. The two things that they give the animal to make them grow fast is growth hormone and estrogen that's carcinogenic. And it is this growth hormone and primary the estrogen in your environment is the root cause of what pushes your prostate cancer, your breast cancer, your uterine cancer. It is the estrogen. The animal also gets vaccines and sedative. So now they took the animal, they fed him growth hormone to push him, they fed him antibiotics, they fed him estrogen, plus the animal's hormone. But because this is a capitalist system, they go to the chicken farm and say, look, instead of buying corn, wheat, and soybean to feed these animals, I have some feed that's high protein at one-tenth the cost. What is it? It's pellets. It's rendered. Do you know what rendering is? R rendering is that process, for those who don't know it, is where you, you know how you make fish soup. You know how you boil a fish down, you take off all the protein. Or you, or you boil uh, the goat meat or whatever you stew it. They take, this is rendering, they take dead animals. They go around, pick up all the dead cows and the horses, roadkill, ASPCA. They dump them in the vat. They stew them down to a stew. Then they concentrate that stew with all the viruses, bacteria and stuff. Now that stew is very rich in protein. But you got everything in it, the stool, the virus, and everything. They take that and put it in pellets. And then they sell it, and that's what the animals are eating. And they believe that it is this rendering that is the source of mad cow disease. They're not sure, because what happened was the British, either because they don't have feed or whatever it is, start taking sheep, slaughtering the sheep, and then feeding the sheep to cows. And they believe, but they're not sure, that there's a little protein they call prions that were in the sheep that when the cow ate the sheep, that prion of protein was transmitted into the cow. So that when they do genetically modified foods and all they manipulate, those things get into your gene pool and change it. Now, they say to you, the mad cow is on, the prion that could cause you to go crazy, but this little protein is only located in the nervous system. But when the cow ate the sheep, where's the first system the prion went? To his digestive system. So they lied to you. That prion is not only in his nervous system because it's in his, the cow's stomach because he had to eat it first. It gets larger than intestines. Then it goes into in his bloodstream. Then it's in the bones. It's all over. So they say, oh, if you just eat the meat part and don't eat the bone, it's a lie. In Japan, they said they test every cow for mad cow disease. In the United States, they test one out of 50,000 and tell you everything is all right. So if it's true or not, this is where they feel the bad cow disease. So your, that chicken is eating these pellets. So now you got a chicken, it's two weeks old, he's two pounds, and he's got estrogen in it, growth hormone. Now he said, how are we going to get him to weigh a little bit more? So what they do is they feed the, uh, the chicken steroids. Steroids. 
You know those who have had asthma or uh, Crohn's disease or uh, lupus, how the doctor give you steroids? That's the same story, steroids they give these. So they give them the steroids a week before they take them to market because steroids make you retain water. So they fatten them up. So when you eat meat in this United States, you're eating steroids, growth hormones, estrogen. So that's the problem with eating meat. So therefore, if you're going to eat meat, you go to the store, they the only thing that I know of is what they call organic or free-range chicken, where they say that the chicken is grown, running around with feed, no antibiotics, no steroids, anything. That's what they say. So if you want to eat meat, you got to eat chicken, which is what they call free-range or organic. And if you're going to eat it, you got to eat the eggs from free-range or organic. So that means then that any milk, yogurt, any milk product from the cow, you are getting your dose of steroids, growth hormone, estrogen. You can't get away from it. So when we say to you, you got to cut out the, the milk product. Or we say to you, go to organic, no GM soy milk, or almond milk, or rice milk. It's not a fad because you want to go organic, and you want to get away from the milk and cheese. So the protocol that we ask people to do is based upon the knowledge that we accumulate on why, what will cause you to be sick. In the next sheet, this is a, let's go, it's a, it's a, okay, let's look at this sheet here. In your handout, you have a sheet on old cholesterol remedy. We're going to get back, get, get back to that. But as long as this was put in this block, it's good. You see, remember the estrogen that is in, they put into the meat? The pesticides that are on your vegetables, they act exactly. So when, when the doctor asks you, the woman goes in, she can't conceive. Why the young woman can't conceive is because she ha okay, the doctor asks her for birth fertility. Um, are you on any birth control pill? The young lady says, no. Okay. So because the doctor thinks she's, a, she's not conceiving because she's not making enough estrogen. So he loads her up with estrogen. Go down to any of these fertility clinics. They load you up. He forgot to tell, ask the lady, okay, you're not on birth control by the doctor, but if you eat meat, you're on birth control. Then. Massive amount. If you're taking eggs, milk, meat, cheese, you're on birth control. If you are drinking anything out of a plastic bottle, right. because plastic leaches into the water and the soda, you're getting massive doses of estrogen. So you're getting estrogen from your meat, you're getting it from your plastics. You're getting it from the milk and cheese and your food. So the woman, the reason the woman can't conceive most of the time when she's young is because she's on the birth control pill. And that's what the birth control pill does. Disrupt and suppress the menstrual cycle. But the doctor is lost because he thinks that it is because the lady doesn't ovulate. So you go to the fertility clinic, they'll take 35, 40, shoot you up, and it's a totally disruptive treatment. Then it doesn't deal with the fact that the man, the male, many men at a certain age in this society, because of the heavy use of pesticides, the sperm count is down 50%. So you got a double problem here when you're trying to conceive of kids. You can't live in this environment. It's not your fault. You're breathing it in the air, you're drinking it in your water, you're eating it in your food, and the young people really get it. I'm going to be 65 years of age and I miss most of the pesticides. My children are right in the middle because what happened during World War II, these big chemical companies were making organophosphates to use on the Germans. They decided not to use these pesticides on the Germans and they kept them in the warehouse. So DuPont and the rest of them say, what are we going to do with these pesticides? They put them on your food. So if you're, if you're like 40 and younger, you write, you got a full lifetime of it. 
If you're 40 and older, you escape a lot of it. And it's these toxins and pesticides which are the root causes of not only sterility, but it's the root cause of your cancer. And you're going to see why. So now let's look at, they did a, uh, I did, we did this presentation for uh, some young ladies. They wanted to know about the uterine fibroids. And then I said, okay, let's just look at the woman's health study. When, when you're taking steroids, this is what steroid, this is what estrogen does. To the male, it pushes our prostate into cancer. To the female, it pushes your uterus into cancer, your breast into cancer, and your ovaries. Now look at what the woman's health study said. That when they gave the estrogen, it causes headaches, depression, and hot flashes. That's what happens to a woman who gets too much estrogen. But you're 55 years of age or 60. You're in your menopause. And you go to the doctor, you say, I got what? Headache, depression, and hot flash. And you don't know it's due to the excess estrogen because those are synthetic estrogens. And then he puts you, say, you're 55 menopause. He puts you on estrogen and aggravates the situation. And they found that a lot of doctors knew for the last 25 years that the, the, this stuff didn't work. It causes thyroid problem, heart attacks and strokes, increased pulmonary embolus, and let me just get the figures because it's difficult to read it there. Yes, yes. Estrogen. They're ignorant of it. They don't know the connection, and therefore they tell you it's of no value. But it's critical. Now, this, so they have definitely said that estrogen increases women's breast cysts, increases breast cancer by a third, ovarian cancer two times, and uterine cancer 12 times. Because the excess estrogen stimulates certain sites on your breast, your uterus, ovary, and for men, the same way. It's a lot of things that cause breast prostate cancer, but one of the main factors in, in large prostate and prostate cancer is the estrogen in the environment. So now you see the, the, one of the problems with estrogen in your environment. So when you say don't drink things out of plastic, to get away from the plastic estrogenic thing, don't eat organic food so you don't get the estrogen and get away from the animal product. It's not telling to tell you, oh, he's a vegetarian, he don't want you. They're practical application. Now, if you go to any country in the world where people are living rurally and not out of the cities, they're not sick. It's when the people begin to come into the cities. Stop walking, stop exercising, stop eating fresh vegetables, start eating the processed foods, then that's when they get sick. It's well documented. So it's that lifestyle. So the fact that we're caught in an urban society with the toxins and the processed foods and everything else, that's what's killing us. So while we're here, we have to then try to do the best we can to stave off and protect the body while you're in this environment. So you see the effect of estrogen is very, very important. Now. In your sheet, let me deal with the cholesterol. We, you can put that up. This is on cancer. I'm going to deal with the sheet on cholesterol. Then we'll get to the cancer, prostate cancer, and then we wind out. 
In your article on cholesterol, basically what this says, instead of reading the entire sheet, it says this. When you go to your doctor, your doctor says your cholesterol level is high. I want you to take these cholesterol-lowering drugs. Statin drugs, I'm pretty sure many of you have gone through this because that's the standard. The cholesterol-lowering drugs are worth $12 billion to the pharmaceutical industry. In this article, they document that they have known for at least 75 years when your arteries get blocked, they're plaque. You heard this term plaque. All it means is that there's a collection on the inside of your arteries of a kind of fibrous hard material composed of calcium, composed of uh, cholesterol, and other fatty acids. It sticks there. And they say, what we're going to do is give you this cholesterol lowering drug for $150 a month, which is going to lower your cholesterol and therefore decrease your ability of your blood vessels being blocked. Mm -hmm. Now, in all of the inserts, they tell you, use it with diet. Doesn't work without diet. So you gotta ask, what's really the question? Mm -hmm. Now, they, they have documented that vitamin B3, niacin, <coughs> is the best thing that the medical people in this country know to get rid of plaques from your blood vessels. And I'll read you just a little excerpt. High density lipoprotein carriers carries dangerous form of cholesterol. In other words, vitamin B3, niacin, what it does, it goes along your blood vessels and scrapes and pulls the plaque off and takes it to the liver to get rid of. But why is it that the medical profession will not tell you, go and get you some vitamin B3? Because vitamin shop, you can get a B complex vitamin for 15 or $20. That'll hold you for two months instead of a, a plaque reducer. Pla Plavix. You understand what's happening here? Most of the doctors don't know vitamin B3 does this because we never were taught it. Those who do know it, they don't say anything. Because if the doctor on grand rounds says, I'm recommending in the medical clinic vitamin B3 to clear out the plaques, then the chief of the service said, no, we, we are, Plavax is in the pharmacy. If you keep ordering vitamin B3, you out of here. You out of here. That's the politics of medicine. Vitamin B3 is the best thing that they know yet to clear out your vet blood vessels. So when we tell individuals, take vitamin B complex. Now, also, vitamin B6. I use the three and the six just to illustrate what they do when you ask the people, well, how is it this person gets better so well? Because your body has a capacity to keep you healthy, provided you first stop killing it, and then you begin to put in what you need to make the thing strong. And that's basically the, the, the what, what you're doing here. They also found that vitamin B6 loosens the plaque. I'll give you an analogy. You know how you take sand and cement, and you mix them into a powder? But you don't get what you call hard concrete till you add water. So what they found is that when you have plaques inside your blood vessels, vitamin B B6 acts to loosen the clot. Okay, this is the way they explain it. When we're in medical school, they didn't tell us this. You're finding this out 35, 40 years later. When the plaque begins to form, calcium, cholesterol, and triglycerides. In order for that plaque to form, you have to have what they call homocysteine. Homocysteine is amino acid that acts like the water. You get it? Homocysteine comes almost exclusively from animal protein. 
So those of you who are not eating a lot of animal protein, you, you have a low homocysteine level, you have very little plaques. Those of you who are eating a lot of animal fat, the animal meat, you have a high homocysteine level. Homocysteine is amino acid from the, your chances of getting plaques are greater. So if you want to clean out a person's artery, all you have to do is just remind them, stay away or minimize the animal fats, chicken, you know, eggs and stuff, number one. Two, take your B complex, B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the three will scrape it off and the six suppresses the homocysteine level. In other words, doctor takes your level, you have a homocysteine level of six. So therefore, you will form plaques. When he or she, the doctor, gives you B6, in two or three weeks, your homocysteine level suppressed. So you can keep your arteries completely clear just with the B, B complex. Now, remember, doctors and PhDs have been doing the research in the lab for the 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. But when they do the research and they say, here's B3 and 6, it never makes the medical school curriculum. We ain't dealing with that here. And that's, that's essentially what happens. That's why you got a $2.2 trillion hospital bill, hospital expenditure, and the people are sick and sick and sick. So what the doctors now tell individuals, they tell individuals, doctors tell you, don't take vitamins. Because now that people don't have money for health care, and they're catching on and they're going more alternative because you don't have the, they're getting healthier. So now that doctors are telling patients, don't take vitamins. Okay. Now we're going to move on. We want to deal as we wind down in the last 20 minutes, the, the presentation, and then we see what we can do with question and answer. So in that article, you can read it. So when we say to you, vitamins this and that, don't, don't say, oh man, how, how could vitamins help? I've been going to my doctor and he didn't help. How could the vitamins help? What is he talking about? Because it's there, they just will not use it. They use and constructed a medical system that's based upon money and insurances. Now, let's look at this article here on cancer. Then we will do prostate cancer. And then we'll wind down for questions and answers. Now, over here, what this basically says here is that the body, every organ of your body, produces new cells. Okay? You have to produce new cells or you will be long dead. So what, when you look at yourself, Biochemically and cellularly, you are not the same person you were last year. Your hair has been changed over, your skin, your liver, most of your heart muscle, a good part of your brain, everything has been replaced. If you didn't have what they call mother stem cells that just keep living on to replace, you would have long been dead. So the concept of cancer, if you ask your doctor, where did this cancer come from that I got? Doesn't answer you. Half of them don't understand where the cancer came from, and the other half who understand don't want to tell you. Now, let me explain simple where cancer is. In the process of a cell dividing, you see this one cell? The cells replace and make new cells by what we call cell division. One cell divides into two. Two divides into four, and it multiplies, okay? So you have a cell division. Two, four, eight, sixteen. It goes down this line and doubles and doubles until its cells reduce 100,000, a million, whatever the body needs that it needs, it produces, and then it cuts it off, okay? It replaces your liver. But in the process of the normal cell division, a certain group of cells begin to divide and act abnormally. Those cells that, di that divide and act abnormally, you call cancer. Let's repeat it. 
in the normal process right now, your liver, your brain, your heart are making new cells. A few of those cells will become cancerous. Anybody not get the concept? Every second you are alive, you're making new cells. And every second you're alive, a certain percentage of those cells become cancerous. The cancer keeps multiplying and multiplying. All cancer means a cell that's not acting right. You see what happens to the cell? It becomes cancerous. The doctors usually deal the cancer with tumors. Okay, they use drugs, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. No lifestyle modification. So you say, well, how are you going to treat cancer with lifestyle and, drug and uh, nutrients? If you understand what's the problem. You see when a cell becomes cancerous, over here, if you could see it, I listed the body's immune system. What does the body do to kill this cancer cell? It's as if you're on a production line making refrigerators. And every so often there is a refrigerator that's defective. So you have someone there, what? Trying to remove the defective ones, right? You have a mechanism in place for removing the defective ones. The body has a mechanism in place for removing the cells that would go cancerous. But your doctor only talks, talks to you about your immune system Oh, it only protects against tuberculosis. It only protects you against uh, colds. No. Your immune cells' primary function, not only to protect you against infectious diseases that enter the body, but the primary function is also to kill cancer cells that normally will come. You understand it? Just like you clean your house. Your house is going to get dirty, so you have a mechanism for cleaning. So cancer cells come from pre-existing cells within your body. Because all organs of your body replace themselves, every tissue of your body, as we sit now, you got cancer. Every one of you have cancer in every part of your body. Now, when you get a cancer cell, what does the body do to protect itself so that this cancer cell is not allowed to grow and hurt you. They have a mechanism called apoptosis. Apoptosis is just a fancy word the cell self-destructs. So most of the cancer cells that your body produce every second, most of them self-destruct. They also have killer cells, T cells, lymphocytes, leukocytes. So your body's cellular mechanism is killing the cancer cells. Anything that you could do to boost your, these cells to become stronger will fight cancer. Exercise, the nutrients, the vitamins and herbs. That's how it works. But the doctor doesn't want to explain to you the biochemical mechanism that the body protects yourself mainly from cancer. And the reason that most of you don't have an overt cancer is because your immune system has been sufficiently strong enough to suppress the cancer cells, okay? Now, the way you also, the way you fight cancer is we know that cancer, oxygen kills cancer cells. So when you ask a person to breathe deeply, you are bringing in more oxygen, you're killing cancer cells. When we ask people to exercise, you're killing cancer cells. When you ask someone to breathe in oxygen, you're killing cancer cells. If the cancer is more advanced, when you go to the doctor, we put in ozone, H2SO4. It kills cancer cells, but they can't tell you that. They can't tell you an IV drip of vitamin C and an IV drip of ozone can knock out many of the cancers, but then Sloan Kettering won't make hundreds of millions of dollars. How come every, you, we, this is known but they don't want that kind of treatment in there. Hyperbaric. Now, also, you see the alkaline serum? Your blood has to have a certain pH. A pH, all a pH means is a liquid. And they have what they call chemicals that make your blood acidic, chemicals that make your blood alkaline. There's a pH scale of seven. 
Anything above seven is alkaline. Anything below seven is acidic. Cancer cells live best in acidic environments. So one way that you can fight cancer and help prevent it is if you can keep your blood alkaline. Uh, what's the, it's like um, uh, an orange is acidic. Where lye, you know, like you use a little lye for your, your, your Drano, it's a little basic. Well, anyhow, if you can keep your blood alkaline, the best way to keep your blood alkaline is chlorophyll. Any green vegetable, any chlorophyll, the best, the single most important molecule for life is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll cleanse the blood, detoxifies the blood, keep it alkaline. Now, you know one of the, re one of the mechanisms that Chlorophyll, any green vegetable, keeps the blood alkaline. How does, al how does it help fight cancer? In order for these cells to fight the cancer, the cells fight the cancer chemically. It fights the cancer by physically engulfing it, and it fights it, what you call electromagnetically. You know how you get these ray guns? That's how cells fight each other. They, don't, they just don't engulf each other. They shoot out chemicals and they kill each other by using electromagnetism. Now, in order for these cells to work maximally against the cancer cell, enzymes inside of your cells, and the enzymes inside of these cells, in order for them to work maximally, enzymes work best in alkaline solution. That's why when people who are acidic, most of the people who have cancer are acidic because acidic environment doesn't allow these cells to work efficiently. Now, let's look at cancer. You see what we write here? See what we wrote here? Tumor, five million cancer cells, one to 10 years detected. Right now, each of us if we went to the hospital and got one of these PET scans, a full body scan, they could not detect cancer. But you got cancer in every part of your body. When is it that the doctor can detect it? The cancer has to reach at least 5 million cells before it can be picked up. So if you got a cancer developing, 1 million, 2 million, the doctor say you cancer free, you are not cancer free. It just means that cancer hasn't reached a level. Enough cancer cells haven't aggregated for the doctor to pick it up. So none of us are cancer free. That's why you must do certain things in your lifestyle to keep your immune system strong to fight off the cancer cells you know are there. So when the doctor tells you that, it's a joke. Now there was just a recent article two weeks ago for those who go to get colonoscopy, where they put the scope up your rectum, up the left uh, large intestines, left colon, then the transference colon, and the right colon. You know the large intestines looking for cancers? They say that the doctors miss every single cancer in your right side because you can't scope them. And when they look through the, coming across to the transference colon, the left descending and out your rectum, they only picked up 50%. So you go to the doctor, they put up the scope, oh, you free, you're not cancer free. And the reason they missed it on the right side is it's difficult to get the scope there. The stool is not cleaned out and you can't see. And the cancer is flat. And the doctor is rushing to get it out to the next patient. And he's inexperienced. And you walk out thinking that you're free. That's why for me, knowing what I know after 37 years, I do whatever I can that I think that I have to do to keep myself maximally healthy and at all costs and lessen I break a leg or fracture, stay hell out of the hospital and the doctor. If you want to, if you want to avoid the high blood pressure, the heart disease, 
the cancers and the rest of it. If you don't adopt a good quality lifestyle like the individual and like our mothers and fathers who came from the South, you're going to be sick because there's nowhere in the world that you're going to be able to maintain your health. So that's why I say here, all tissues of the body continuously Re, all tissues of the body continuously replace old and dead cells with new cells by cell division. A certain percentage of these new cells act in an abnormal or cancerous behavior. All tissues of the body at all times have cancerous cells. The body's immune system keeps these cancers suppressed and in check. We are all terminal. So don't let the doctor tell you, oh, you got six months, you got three months. He don't know what he's talking about. And he's right. The way they will treat you, you won't last three or six months. Because that's the thing. Now, notice over here, by the time you get your colon cancer, how long has it been there? One to ten years. So when that doctor puts a scope up your rectum and he sees a polyp, most, most of us... Over 50 have polyps. Most are benign. And he snips it. And it's cancerous. That's been there 10 years. If you have, the, it's a, the, the cancer only manifests itself. The doctor can only pick it up when it reaches a certain level. In order to reach the level that the doctor can pick up in your breast and your prostate, it's been there 10 years. Easy. And you ask the doctor, well, well, how's it been there 10 years? Because your body has been fighting it. When your body loses the ability to suppress the cancer, you develop an overt cancer. Cancer does not kill you directly. Cancers kill by using up your nutrition. Most cancer patients starve to death. So when you're talking about cancer, you don't be afraid about having cancer. You got it. Now, what is it, now you understand that concept, what is it you want to do to try to keep the cancer suppressed so that it won't manifest it and help you? So it's a war going on, and that's the whole purpose here. We're going to end on prostate cancer. We've got five minutes. At the end of the sheet is a protocol by Dr. Stephen Sinatra. And he's giving you a protocol for a number of different things. Now, all of this illustrates is not necessarily the $15. But one way to get around nutrition. When we have helped people who could not eat, you take, you see they call this green stuff. They have what they call green and red. All the companies do is get organic alfalfa, organic uh, Wheatgrass, organic uh, alfalfa, wheatgrass, barley, organic chlorella and spirulina. Loaded with all kinds of nutrients. When you take this combination, you have so many nutrients and vitamins, you don't have to eat. So what they're trying to illustrate, they're trying to sell the product, but the point is what they're trying to illustrate is that one teaspoon of concentrated green powder. So in other words, you get organic barley, organic wheatgrass, organic alfalfa, organic chlorella and spirulina, you put it in there. One teaspoon of that is equivalent to five to six servings of vegetables because they, they took five or six servings of vegetables, dried it out, and powdered it to come down to one teaspoon. So if you, got, you, should, you, should, if you have somebody who's sick, the sick person is not going to be able to eat six helpings of vegetables. But what you're after is the nutrient in the vegetable. And by taking it in a powder form, you're getting a high nutrient. So let's say somebody took six of these. If you took six of these teaspoons, you'll get an equivalent of 30 helpings of vegetable. You can't eat that many. Plus, by the time you buy this, the cost effectiveness of powder, when you can't see, I don't eat, I can't afford organic most of the time. And I don't eat the fresh vegetables. So when I can eat organic, I eat it. But I know that there isn't enough nutrient in organic at that quantity to help my immune system. So I load up with one teaspoon of that six times a day. I'm pouring in the nutrients the cell needs. And they have equivalent in fruit. 
you go to vitamin shop. They, they take all of the berries and strawberries and everything. And they put it in a concentrated form. So what happens is one teaspoon is seven to servings. Now, if any one of you could eat seven servings of vegetables, organic can't do it. But if I take six of these a day, I got 35 herbs. It's my cells. Okay, as we wind down, the concept is this. Get up in the morning, and I take my green stuff, one teaspoon. Now, I got five helpings of vegetables. Then I take a teaspoon of the red stuff. I have seven vegetables of fruit. The nutrient value, you have the nutrient value. Then I take a, a big scoop of uh, organic protein powder. Now, I got my protein. And then I take some omega-3 fish oil, and I pour it in there. So now I got my protein. I got the, the fruit, the vegetables, and I have the oil. All of that, when you add it up, wouldn't cost me more than 60 cents. Now, you would have to spend maybe $15 or more to try to get the equivalent nutrient. We're after nutrient. I mix it up. I put my vitamin C in it and anything else I want to put. I, I mix it up and I drink it. That's my breakfast. That's my lunch, my, my dinner. Lunch, I have a, a, a nice lunch. And in between, I use the green stuff six times a day. Because what I'm doing is I'm feeding myself. So, okay, I get up in the morning. I drink this juice. Within a half an hour, all of those nutrients have been absorbed into my stomach. And within a half an hour after drinking this, my cells are beginning to get the nutrients that it needs. So my cells tell the brain, I got all my nutrients for the day. I'm fine. You don't feel hungry. Then you get up. You have a breakfast. Eggs, bacon, whatever you have. Coffee. You, you eat it. And that food is going to sit in your stomach four hours. If you put a protein with it, it's five hours. So while I have drink, I drink mine at eight. I'm feeling good by nine o'clock. I'm energized. I got enough nutrient for the day. I don't have to eat again because my cells have what they need to maintain the health, to fight off cancers. But you ate at, at seven or eight o'clock. It's sitting in your stomach. So what happens at noon? You're hungry. That's why people are hungry at twelve at well noon. Their stomach is full. So they swell up and it tells the brain I'm full. But after an hour, the cells that says to the brain, I don't have any nutrient. I'm hungry. 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11, 12. So your cells are telling the brain, I am hungry. Because the nutrient is in the stomach. Then you eat lunch at 12. Then what you ate at 8, just beginning to eat your small intestine. So what you ate at 8, your cells in your body can get the nutrient at 1 o'clock. And then you eat again at 12. And you just keep eating and then you are not nourished. So for people who, for people like myself who I assume is healthy, that's how I sustain myself. That's my maintenance. For those who are, 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 are sick, you pour it in. And everybody should be on this regimen, one, because it's very inexpensive. It's the least expensive way to get nutrient into your body. You can't eat seven servings of organic food you can't afford. You can't eat seven servings of food, vegetable with pesticides. So people say, do you say, don't eat? Eat what you want. When you begin to learn, you're filtering your water, you, you know, you're going to modify what meat you eat. If it's organic, you modify the egg. That's something that can be worked out. But in lieu of the fact, if you don't have the money, and you're afraid what's out here, this is a way to get the nutrient in the body. You don't have to eat anything else. To end the note on prostate cancer, the source of the prostate cancer in men, in your pro call, I'm just going to read what it is. When you go to the doctor, as I was explaining, as long as Brother Clemson uh, mentioned it to you in the public, what he feels he has, I'll just follow. After going through this whole talk, Brother, I give him this list on prostate cancer. For the men, we're finishing two minutes. You call PSA, prostate specific antigen. That's what they test for. You gotta come in for the test. Black men gotta have it. Prostate specific antigen is every cell, every cell tissue of your body secretes into the bloodstream a specific protein to that organ. So when we draw the blood, we can test for the proteins that came from your heart, your brain, your liver, your testes. But one of the and the same with women. 
So one of the proteins that spill into our blood from our prostate gland as a result of the normal process of cells dying and in the normal process of cell, men's will have prostate-specific antigen. It's just a protein that comes from your prostate. Then the doctor says, your PSA should be four. It used to be six, but they dropped to four. What the first thing they don't tell you is that's a value for white men. They basically having standardized it for people of color because of melanin and the whole biochemistry. But let's take four. Mr. So-and-so, your PSA level is six. You must have cancer. Now remember, a PSA level higher than four is abnormal according to them. But, first thing is, is it a lab error? Then the second thing you repeat. Now, let's say you have a PSA of uh, six or seven. The doctor will say, I want to take you for biopsy so that we can see if it's cancer or not. That's what they, that's what they will tell you. Told Bush not to call me. He only got 10 days ago. <laughs> he's, he's messing up our reputation here. Okay. We, I, I will complete in five minutes. The brother just want to. Let me just say that I'm honored to be here at the Slave Theater and before you to give this presentation and also honored to be in the presence uh, in the company of uh, Attorney Walton Maddox and all of our African people as we stand in front of you. I'm going to do a, pro a slide presentation which comprises about 550 slides. It's a lot of material and we will be able to cover the material in a little over an hour to an hour and 15 minutes because I've done the presentation a number of times. So because of the material that you will see, so a lot of vi every, it's 550 slides, it's visual material, and all of it is historic. So the recommendation that I make for those who are interested is that you should try to avail yourself of the video of the slide presentation as they make it, when, when the uh, organization from the slave makes it available. The reason is uh, so that you will be able to sit back at your leisure and look at different sections of the slide presentation. The slide presentation is titled Africans of the Pacific. But what we do is we tie in our brothers and sisters and our ancestors who live in the Pacific Islands with those of us who live on the continent of Africa, Asia, and in the Americas. So we're going to take a travel that's gonna take us back at least 3.5 million years, come up to the present, and we're going to cover the entire globe. And this is the spans of your history. So let us begin so that we can start showing the slides. Um, we start out with the slide. This is of a sister, uh, Sela, Grace Molisa, an African woman who lives in the South Pacific. When we say the South Pacific, we're talking about those islands on the other side of the world. Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Tahiti, Hawaii, Nairam, Guam, Saipan, a number of them, all the ones you've heard of in uh, many of your readings out in uh, the, uh, World War II. So this is a sister who lives in the South Pacific and what we're saying is the people of the South Pacific, the Africans of the South Pacific are your people. 
This is a slide showing you what is uh, normally projected by the European as the person who lives in the South Pacific. So you will get the impression that is of a white woman with long hair. And these uh, advertisements indicate the islands they're talking about. For instance, Tahiti, Bora Bora, Fiji, Cook Islands, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, and Solomon. So with the standard miseducation that is presented in America and in the Western world, you would think that the South Pacific Islands are an island of white people or Japanese people. We're going to now go back to find out the origin of us as African people. According to the archaeological remains and fossils, mankind is placed as its origin in the Rift Valley of Africa. Everybody in the world places Africans, the start of mankind in Africa. The European scholars, the African scholars, the Asian scholars. There's no dispute that mankind that we know of at this point began in the rift valleys of Africa. Millions of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and thousands of years ago, African people, your ancestors, migrated out of Africa in waves across the land bridge and the water bridge to, to originally inhabit Europe, all of Asia, down into Southeast Asia, all of the islands of the Pacific, Australia, all the way over to Hawaii and Tahiti. We then traveled across the land and water bridges to cross the Asian uh, American or the Asian uh, uh, land mass here. I don't want to call it North America, but the indigenous land mass you know as Alaska. We crossed in, populated what you call North America into the Caribbean and South America. So I will show you the archaeological remains show and we will show the presence that the original person to inhabit all of the earth before there were any other people were the African people. So that when we show you African people in the Pacific or in Asia or in India or in Taiwan, you will know how they got there. They are the original people who, who arrived there. This just shows you the lo relative large land mass of Africa. Africa is the second largest land mass of the world. It's 12 million square miles. But this is the true perspective. In the maps that they show in the schools, they always show Africa as smaller than what it actually is. So they, they distort, mis, they minimize Africa by uh, lying to you on the map. Here is Africa. You can put China, America, Australia, and all of Europe into Africa. That's how large it is. But they don't want you to know how large and great your landmass is, so they distort the map. So we're just giving you a true perspective of how large it is. This is in search of early man. Now we're going to start on the archaeological proof of what we're talking about. This slide just illustrates that there are archaeological fossils remain that you can use any number of methods to date so that you see that they are proof. This illustrates that there are fossil remains found all over Africa, Europe, Asia, and in the Pacific. But the oldest and greatest amount are found in Africa, being the origin. This just indicates that it is the African, not the European, who's making these finds. If you ask the European who's making them, he'll lie to you and say that he is. But it's the African who's making these finds. This is a, a fossil remain of the oldest known human being on Earth. It is an African woman. She is 3.5 million years old. We call her by the Ethiopian name Danknesh. So the oldest known human being in the world is an African woman found in Ethiopia named Danknesh. She's three and a half million years old. She was found next to her family, typical of Africa. So that anybody wants to place human mankind in your history, you started back three and a half million years old. This is just to show you that there are rock paintings that we made hundreds of thousands of years old. The oldest fossil remain in Asia is about 500,000 years. The oldest fossil remain in Europe is about 250,000. The oldest is Danknesh is 3.5 million, and Zinzanthropus Boise in South Africa is 1.6 million. This just goes, this is an illustration to show you a, an African. 
could be any short statured African uh, in any part of Africa. What I want to mention about that uh, fossil remain of Danknesh is that she was a very short woman, about three foot tall. So the archaeological fossil remains indicate that the earliest type of African to inhabit the earth was a short statured African. In Central Africa, we call it Twa, T-W-A. And in other parts of Africa, Southern Africa, we call it Khoi Khoi and Kalahari. This is an African woman, you notice the large buttocks. This is an actual, this is a, a small sculpture of this African woman. The reason we show it is because if you go to the museums in Europe, you will find these small statues in the Museum of Europe. They're called, they're called Grimaldi. Grimaldi was a short statued African who traveled from what, is, what they call now Southern Africa, but what Dr. Bin tells us is Mona Motapa, traveled 30,000 BC and inhabited Europe. So you have some archeological and artifact evidence that short statured Africans in populated Af Europe at least 30,000 BC. This just goes to show you that the world can be looked at in any form. Don't let them fool you with the way they want to project it. This indicates just another map to show you how large Africa is. It is larger than, again, America, China, Europe, and Australia. It is really the central area and the most important throughout the world when it comes to navigation and uh, natural resources. This just goes to show you beyond the melting pot. This is a projection by the United States government that says that if the present immigration and the present birth rate of people of color continue, that this will be a non-white country in terms of population in about 50 years. The birth rate of European people throughout the world is negative. They're losing population each year. You need a 2.1% population to hold your rate. The Europeans throughout the world, including the whites in America, have a 1.6. People of color have on an average of about 3.4. This is just an illustration to uh, show you about American immigration. They show you that the, the European came out of Europe looking for land, the next wave, the Irish, and then the Germans. Basically what it says is that all Europeans came out of Europe looking primarily for food. And in the process, they were killing and murdering and stealing everything that they could have. This is just a particular map, recent, that shows you that the immigration rate of, into America is such that three quarters of the in, individuals immigrating into America are non-white. This begins to show you the map of the South Pacific or the Pacific, bordered by the North Pole, South Pole, Asia, Australia to the West, America, and uh, South America to the east. It is all of these islands we're calling the South Pacific, the Africans in the Pacific. This is a picture drawn by Europeans when they came into the South Pacific about 200 years ago. Now, I would like anyone, when you buy the video and look at it, to tell me which of these are the Hawaiians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Maoris, Papua New Guinea, the ones they found in Nam, you can't tell. And basically, these are African people. This is who lives now, presently in the South Pacific, who's always lived in the South Pacific. We're going to go now to Egypt so that we can take you in to see what you did to give the world civilization. Now you know you populated the world. What did you do to give the world civilization? We're in Egypt, and here is a sister. And you're standing in front of a statue of God, Goddess Best, the oldest known God, Goddess in the world. God, Goddess Best, if you notice, is short stature because it represents the Twa, the Hutu, coming from Central Africa. It also has the shrunken cheetah's head. So even though we're in Northeast Africa, in Egypt, the cheetah's head show you the origin of the God, Goddess Best, and the navel shows you where we came from his mother. This, now we're going to show you who are the Egyptians, so people will be clear on who the Egyptians are, the ones that are in your Bible. Here is Pharaoh Namer, who unified Egypt 3500 BC. Showing you Egypt, what are we going to deal with along the Nile, because the civilization began in Central Africa. As Dr. Ben tells us, the uh, priest who said uh, on the papyrus of Honefa, we Africans, we Egyptians, came from the beginning of the Nile 
that's Uganda and Ethiopia, where the God happy dwells at the foothills of the mountain and moon. That's Kenya and Uganda. So they're telling you that the civilization began in Central Africa and over hundreds of thousands of years it worked its way up. This is why in the textbooks the Europeans do everything to try to convince you or lie to you that it started in Iraq. It didn't. And we have ample proof of it. The three major pyramids, there are 72 pyramids around Cairo. The three major pyramids are for the for grandfather, Khufu, the son, Kafra, and Menkara. These three Africans, grandfather, father, and son, are located in these three major pyramids. The oldest known stone building was, was the Step Pyramid of Saqqara. This pharaoh was in the Step Pyramid of Saqqara. So you have this oldest stone building, 2,500 years BC, built for this pharaoh, followed by these th major three pyramids. Dr. Ben just brings it to our attention that they found an older stone building, older than the 2,500, near the Sudanese-Egyptian border. He says the foundation is at least 9,000 BC, that you can document that you were building stone houses. Here is a close-up of the pharaoh Zuza, who is in that step pyramid of Saqqara. Here is the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, the old, one, now the second oldest stone building. It's located near Egypt, 47 stories high, and it has seven layers. Remember this birthday cake uh, architectural structure because you're going to see it in Asia. This is showing you the largest of the pyramids, of the major pyramids. It's 48 stories high. They were built with large bricks, excuse me, large stones about the size of automobiles or small vans. Here is a man sitting in the opening where the grave robbers broke in to show you the magnitude. So this, this story that they give you in the Bible, that Jews from Asia built this pyramid by mud and brick. These pyramids were built at least 1,500 years prior to the entrance of the first Asian, regardless of what they call themselves. They were built by huge stone, not mud and brick, and they were built by skill labor, skilled architects of Africans. As, as we remember, there are three seasons in Egypt. There's a, inund there's a planting season, the harvest season, and four months when the Nile inundates. The four months when the Nile overflows its bank where the population couldn't work, that's the four months that your architect put the people to work to build these monuments. This is just going to show you the pharaohs that's in that largest pyramid. This is a god you call it the Sphinx, but it's really God Hermachus, representing the second of the pharaohs in the second largest pyramid. The illustration is to show you that there weren't just three large pyramids, but there are 72 pyramids because this is the burial ground around Egypt. Show you how the European and others use your symbol, the pyramid, the sunburst for Ra, and his son Horus who lost his eye in the fight with his, his, his uncle using your symbols. This is just to illustrate, to begin to illustrate the architectural and the sculpture ability of African people so you'll see who, who started architecture. This is of Ramesses II and the brother to give you the comparison of this slide. We're around Cairo. This is uh, Dr. Ben and Gary Bird. We're up around the pyramids to show you that we need our elders to guide us and others to help us. Dr. Clark also around one of the temple complexes in Egypt, guiding us and helping us. Dr. Ben in front of the Egyptian Museum, always with the camera, bringing you back information. We're going to now go to uh, Amenhotep IV Akhenaten, the one who documented, began uh, the nonviolence. That's Tutankhamun's relative. Here is Akhenaten's wife, Nefertiti, the one you wear around your neck is the Europeanized version. But here is an actual beginning sculpture of Nefertiti who came from Asia. Show you Tut Uncommon's mother-in-law, African woman, beautiful with her eyebrow makeup, her earrings, and her wig. Let's go to Tut Uncommon, the boy king, so that we can begin to illustrate to you some of the contributions you made to the world. I'm going to take you down into the burial chamber of Tutankhamun because you now know that you populated the world to bring the first people, but now we're going to begin to document how you gave the world civilization, things that you use and do every day. This civilization that we're going through equally appeared in West Africa and Southern Africa. 
because the civilization went from Central Africa and went in all directions. But because we built in stone along the Nile, the evidence of what we did is most evident along the Nile in Egypt and Ethiopia and Sudan. It's still some large stone structures in Zimbabwe. Showed Tutankhamun and his wife. This is some of the artifacts uh, taken from Tutankhamun's burial chamber. And he was a minor king. Look at the earrings and the uh, jewelry chest. To begin to show you the intricate artwork and skill that your people were doing at this time. We are around 2000 BC. There is no Greece yet. Showing you the bracelets and the earrings and look at the fine beads and the wire. We could just spend an hour just talking about the art that we had and the skills to put together these fine beads. We don't need Japanese, Europeans, or anybody to teach us the fine art of how to do things in detail. Here is another anklet, a bracelet. Here is a necklace. Again, look at the fine beadwork and wire work, and you may begin to recognize some of this beadwork in the artwork that you buy on 125th Street and Fulton Avenue from the brothers from the continent and the sisters. Here, again, is a necklace. And because of the time, let's go through this very quickly. You have two African sisters. The sisters Aset and Nepteb. But notice, what are they wearing? Kente cloth. Look, just go back for one second. So this is a necklace. We can deal with the beautiful uh, artwork and the, and the skill we had to do it, but you can begin to see your kente cloth right here as the weaving here. Here is the wings of Horus and his son, the father. The father is always the male god is represented by the son. The wings are rep it represents his son and the female components there. So here's the, the male father. Here are the two female components, and here's the son. Here is Tunin Common. We're now in the museum. His right foot is fo left foot is forward, so this is a life statue of Tunin Common carrying his war bolo that you will see in the Pacific. Here are the boats that came out of his um, tomb. We just want to begin to give you a taste of what it is, the skill and art that your people did. Here's God got his best, worked in alabaster. Just think of the tools you needed. Here's God got his best in a headrest, but it's your typical stool you buy, the folding stool with the hinges and the dowels, so you had these things. We're going to now deal with one of the beds in Tutankhamun's tomb, and you're now beginning to see God Het Heru or Hathor coming in the form of a cow and the son, the male, the, the, the male component of God. You invented the bed. Now, this is 2000 B.C., we had vented these things long before this, but we're giving you a taste. Here is another bed. You had a bed. You had pillows, sheets, headrests, dowels and pegs. God, goddess, best again. You invented the umbrella. Here's your umbrella. Go back to that slide for a second. In the back, you notice the glass vase, alabaster vase. You had vented and worked in glass all types of glass, opaque glass and transparent glass. That's how we know they had glasses, eyeglasses, and telescopes and microscopes. Here is the chair, Tudin Carmen's chair, wood carving. You want to know where the master carpenters come from? Gold laid with nails, screws, dowels, pegs, all of the carpentry to its highest form, and no one has improved upon it yet. Here is the chariot written by Tutankhamun thousands of years before there was a Greece. There was no way that Greece or the Assyrians or anybody brought you the chariot. Here you invented the wheel, you invented the axle and the differential. So without the African, there would have been no motor transportation or otherwise. To show you that the Africans wore dreads, so the brothers from Jamaica didn't originate it. Next. The, the walking stick. For the elders and others, the bow and arrow, you invented this form of warfare and hunting. What you know to be the boomerang, which will show up in Australia, but the Africans called it the throwing stick. We use it in warfare and we use it in hunting so that you can begin to see the connection between the South Pacific. You can't deal with the Africans in the South Pacific without first understanding where they came from and what they brought from Africa. Here is in Tutankhamun's tomb, you're looking at the chess set. 
Sinet, Batgammon, Checkers and Chess. They are different size sets. That's where the chess comes from. That's where checkers, all of it comes. So when somebody tells you, European, that you can't learn chess, you invented it. And as, as Brother Maddox said, he is, the ancest, he is the descendant of those who invented law. And here is the Valley of the Queens. Here is a queen. Notice she's on her throne in a beautiful silk and a beautiful head piece, sitting on kentic cloth, throne, playing. What is she playing? Chess. 2000 BC. Here is the Brotherhood, the Pharaoh being initiated into the Brotherhood. Anyone who's a member of any fraternity or sorority in the world, regardless of what name you get, it comes out of Africa. All your secret societies and other societies. This is the Brotherhood. Here's the Pharaoh who's the Grand Master and the two who are bringing him into it. This is the back. And notice, each leg is to the left forward, life. Left forward and the other, reverse the slides, the previous one. And she, Okay, let's go on. Here is the Pharaoh taking the oath of the Brotherhood. Remember, in Africa, where it all began, you had to be an African to be part of the Brotherhood or what you call a mystery system. So if you are now presently part of any brotherhood, fraternity or sorority, and if there's anybody in it that's not an African or African origin, then you're not part of a brotherhood or a sisterhood. It was all designed to sustain the society. So if you, and the central theme about sustaining society was the protection of the woman and the children. Here's the Pharaoh with his two wives. Another pharaoh, short statute, African in Egypt. Here's the pharaoh, again, being anointed by his wife and his sister-in-law. Here is the pharaoh being anointed, baptized, long before the baptism of, of the Christian. Here's God, Tahuti, and Horus. Remember, at this, what you are examining now, there is no Christianity yet. There is no Judaism yet. There is no Islam yet. There is no Buddha yet because you will not have brought it into existence yet, all of which comes from this. So you are way ahead of any of the religions you are now presently member of. Here is the actual stone carving on the wall in the temple so that you can actually see it exists and no one is trying to fool you with a picture. The Pharaoh being anointed by the brothers in the craft. Here is the Pharaoh in his chariot in his horse, with all of the regalia, and his hunter, used of the cheetah. We had already learned how to deal with animal behavior where we work with animals. No one brought the horse to the, to the continent. The horse was here. No Arabs or anybody else brought it to you. This is long before any Arab or anyone else will come in. You're looking at Egypt at the time where there are no foreign invaders yet. Here's the pharaoh again. He's now, let's speculate, he's in Kenya. Or he's in Tanzania, come from Egypt, he's hunting lion. Or he come from Ethiopian hunting. To show you the connection, there was movement between Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya. There is no difference, artificial difference. There were one people, one rulers, one conquerors. Showing you again the Pharaoh in his different um, uh, 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 situation here. In this case, he's hunting, but if you notice, you'll begin to see the beginning of what you can call military science, where you had archers and you had horsemen. This is where you get your whole military general and the whole structure. Here is what the average Egyptian did daily. Those who did this, washed clothes, went to the market and conducted other affairs. This is the harp. These are cisterns, the shaker. You know what we do in the Caribbean and others. And here is your violin, your banjo. Here are some sisters and brothers dancing. Here's a sister playing a tambourine, one playing a small harp, one playing a tambourine, one playing a large harp. Here's the sisters in an entertainment group. Some are dancing in bikinis, others are in their beautiful dress regalia. So when we have our carnivals throughout the Caribbean and, and America, you realize where it all started from. And here are some incense that melts down. And the sisters are not only clapping and dancing, but one, they're playing an instrument. And we'll see what that instrument is. See, the sisters in their beautiful silk, 
One is playing the double flute, which is now what is going to be your flute, your piccolo. Here, she's playing your violin, viola, banjo, so you can begin to see your string instrument and all of your wood reed instrument, beginning of your flute and clarinet, and here's the harp. So when anybody tells you that the uh, only instruments that began in Africa was the drum, obviously they're lying. Here are the actual paintings on the wall so that you can see it exists. The double instrument, the, the wind instrument, the, the, the violin, banjo, and the harp. Here is God, this, this is Nefertari, the wife of Ramesses II. And this is goddess Hedheru. She is, she is uh, leading, the goddess here is leading the queen. So you're looking at a queen and a goddess. And uh, we gotta stay with that slide for a second. You notice again, you women, our women. You are the standards for the world. No one is the standard for you. You had at this makeup, lipstick, eyebrow, wigs, braids, you gave the world's cosmetic industry. Look at the beautiful pectoral, the silk, the wrap. Look at this beautiful dress. And the reason I use this illustration with my wife, Mary, who's here, is that we were at a reception and I noticed that she was wearing the same dress and pattern as the goddess Het Heru 3,000 years ago. So then you begin to understand how they go back to the museums in Egypt and the West Africa and they, they record your styles and they reduplicate them and they put their names on them. So all of the styles that you're wearing in jewelry and all of the beautiful prints, they come out of Africa, all of Africa. Now my son recognized, go back one second and then we'll go on. My, I asked my son, who is this? She said, this, my old youngest son is five years old. He said, that's my mommy, that's my mommy, that's my mommy. <laughs> Here are the bagpipes. Here is the god uh, best playing the bassoon. Here is a priest playing the double flute and the, and the tambourine so that you see it exists. Here are the men and women always working in a cooperative manner, hunting and fishing using the throwing stick. Here it shows you the fact that Africans again use animals to help in herding, you started husbandry, you started domestication of animals. You see, they go to Iraq and they go to all these places and make the statement, but they can't prove it because they know the oldest is here. Here, just to show you the giraffe, to show you the connection between Central Africa and the plains, to illustrate that you had already domesticated wheat, corn, Wine making. Here is showing you the double wheel and the axle, the differential that you need for all automobiles or wagon. Showing you in a little medicine. Here's the, here, is a, here is a physician with a stethoscope. The first known indoor toilet. This is an indoor toilet that you use in the temple that connected into a drainage system into the Nile. So we, need, we knew the, the importance of not only the stethoscope to diagnose, but also hygiene and disposal of waste. Circumcision, done long before any Jews or anyone else can claim it. Okay? These are the four canopic jars, symbolic of the four sons of Horus. The reason I included to illustrate that when you were embalmed, the same autopsy that you do throughout the world, you gave the world a whole medical science of dissection and anatomy. And your, four, your organs of your internal organs, your liver, your gallbladder, your intestines, your stomach were placed in these four jars. This is the embalming jars. Medicine, the woman is now sitting upright on the birthing chair and the baby's coming out. You're supposed to deliver babies sitting up by gravity after walking. The Europeans and others got it all mixed up. They lay you on your back, the babies can't push out, then they cut you open for the insurance. Here's Goddess Aset, pregnant with her son Heru, sitting on the birthing chair. 
at Temple Cuomo. In between her, next to her, is a set of surgical instruments needed by the physician in Hotep to take the baby by cesarean section in the event she couldn't deliver. In other words, you had already developed the instruments and the technique for abdominal surgery. So any one of you who go into the hospital and get your gallbladder, appendix, anytime they open up your stomach or your chest, you could see, begin to see where it, it is. This is in the double temple of Kuombo in Egypt. And the physician who's going to next perform the abdominal surgery is Inhotep, the god of medicine. You'll see him in a larger form. I'm sorry to cut him off. Here's a short statued African working in Egypt. Here is another set of Africans working in Egypt. You wouldn't, there's no distinction between Nubia and Sudan. You made boats. Showing you Africans chiseled on the wall, building large boats in mass. Some of the beginning, that's a shipyard you just saw. So how we use the ships, our boats with nets to fish. This is the African culture that you gave the world. That the European came and disrupted and then took it over for himself. Ship, one of the four ships in the large pyramid to show you that you made these ships. This is about uh, 3000 BC. This is the beauty of Dr. Bin exposing us to Egypt. This is a ship showing you that African people had large ships, seagoing ships. And you could see how many men were on these ships. So you want to find out who started yachting and all of this sailing that you see up and down. You see where it all came from. And you notice that you have very large fish and squid. So they wanted to illustrate to you that they were in the ocean, not a river. So now you begin to see how Africans navigated around the world. They said, we don't know how they did it. You saw the large ships. Here is God Heru, Horus, giving to the king the sextant. That instrument that everybody uses in the world today and have been using for thousands of years to navigate to the sun. So for those who are merchant seamen, you want to know how the African travel? You saw the large boat. Now you see the navigational instrument that everybody used called a sextant. This is in the temple of Setai I Abydos, as Dr. Ben teaches us the first pilgrimage approximately 1500 BC that you can document. And later on you will see how we, use, how we laid out the stars for the navigation. This is your contribution to civilization. You gave the world the alphabet. Without the alphabet, no one could write. You gave the world, this is an alphabet of the African, your netta netcha. It just shows you the comparison to the ABC that you use, but it also want to show you here that without the e Egyptian or the African alphabet, there would be no quote unquote Semitic alphabet. No Arab or whoever they are would be able to write for you, those of you who are Muslim. Those of you who are Jew, you could not write without the alphabet. You couldn't write without what came out of Africa because what you call the writing of the Semite, whatever that is, really comes from these alphabets, but they are parts of it, they are abbreviations. So without the alphabet, mankind could not write or read or communicate. You gave the world grammar, all forms of grammar. Nouns, pronouns, etc. Here is a brother walking with his stick. And you notice, they seem to be involved in certain kinds of activities. If any one of you seen Bruce Lee or any of our karate experts with nunchucks and these sticks, all of these sticks and all kinds of war clubs. Where did karate, judicial, and all martial arts come from? Well, I'm showing you the pictures here, but thanks to my brother, Dr. Ben, an elder, and a brother from Detroit who supplied me with the next set of period pictures. They come, these pictures come from the temple of Ramesses V. Next. What are they doing? Okay, there is your war instruments, and you begin to see the brothers with their karate stances. This comes from the temple of Ramesses VI, taken by a brother from Detroit on the last trip with Dr. Ben. He supplied the slides to me. Next. What are these brothers doing? They're locked into a wrestling match. He's throwing the other brother. Your, your wrestling, your karate, your judicial. This is what you will take to Asia. Next, and look at the stance. Direct. Now this is only what Doc the Ben has brought us to some documentation. You look in 2000, 3000 BC. This is some of the 
civilization you will take to Asia, there are no such thing as martial arts originating in any place in the Orient. You, you brought civilization and you civilized what you call China, India, Japan, all of them, and we will show it. Here are the two largest temples. Here's a temple of, of uh, Karnak here and of uh, the Grand Lodge of Waset. We're going to have to move a little bit, and I'll just show it to you. Here is the largest temple complex in the world. This temple, let me see if I can get this light for a second. Okay. The temple that you see on the top measures a quarter of a mile from the top of the slide to the bottom. It measures from your left to the right approximately one mile. Now, you know of any temple or church that is a quarter of a mile by a mile long? This is the temple complex at Karnak, the largest temple complex in the world. And below is the Grand Lodge Awaset. This is about 2500 BC. At that Grand Lodge Awaset, the second location, if you want to know the origin of the brotherhood and the mystery system, it started at the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara 3500 years BC. Because of invasions, we moved it down 300 miles into what you call Luxor or Waset. And just a second. This is the Grand Lodge where the university education was brought to the highest. What the brothers were teaching in here was mathematics, law, engineering, calculus, geometry, karate. All of what you call civilization will be taken out of Egypt and begin to be spread through Asia and Europe. And this is how you begin to trace the civilization, the rise of the Indian civilization, Chinese, Japanese. This is the Grand Lodge of Waset. Now, go back, let's go back, continue on. I drew a map that shows you the Grand Lodge of Waset was located in Egypt. And it was located here, 2500 BC. All of these other dots represent the subordinate lodges, the colleges. And these went from southern Africa all the way to the far end Burma, then India, and all along the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, what is now Greece, Rome. Greece, where did you put these lodges? Italy, Greece. What is all of Western Asia, what you now call Iraq, Israel, Jordan, Iran, uh, Ethiopia, Mono, uh, Zimbabwe, Monomotapa, India, and Burma. This is where you will begin to spread that high knowledge to each of these people, and this is the beginning of the civilization you will call or trace the Indian, Chinese, and Japanese as we move on. This is, the, this is showing you the entrance coming into it. This is showing you the front. This is the Grand Lodge of Waset. All of those of you who are brothers in the Solomon Temple and others who give homage to the Solomon Temple in, in Asia, why? This temple is 1,500 years older than it. It's the second original, and Solomon's temple is a copy. So the homage should be played to either the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara or to this, pyramid, or to this temple complex that's located in Waset or Luxor. And this is the center from where you are, your scientists, your engineers, your military scientists, would, when we conquered, would spread the civilization. And you're seeing uh, the interior and exterior of it. Keep moving. So that you'll see that it exists. So no brothers can tell you, I have loyalty to Solomon's temple in Asia or Israel when you got the original. And this is just a panoramic view of, of it at this point. There's no excuse. Now we're going into grand, the, the, the temple of Karnak to show you the largest temple complex in the world. Again, to show you that it exists. All of this is about 300 miles south of Cairo. To show you the architectural genius of your people. There is no Greece, there is no Rome, there is no Israel. They don't exist yet. And I'm just in the middle, just shooting all around me for as much as a half a mile in each direction. The temple complex was destroyed by an earthquake, but they're rebuilding it. All of the temples, churches, mosques, and pagodas in the world are designed after this complex.
Stop here. On the, on the uh, temple complex in, in um, Karnak, you're looking at the, the, the decimal system. The number one, you see the strike one? That's one. You see the, the upside down U? That's 10. And you little, see the little squirrel here. I'm sorry, this, the projector isn't working. That's 100. You were using the, the, what you call a base 10 system or the decimal system for tens of thousands of years. No Greek, no European, no one. You gave the world the ability to count and to calculate. Next slide. Just need the light so he can make the change, and we're, we're making good time. The point of the slide, again, is to, just to illustrate to you, as Dr. Ben has been doing for 50 years, that you civilize the world. This is the contribution you have made to the world. It's number two. What I'm showing you here is the symbol. The symbol is one of the city, which you see to be a symbol of the peace symbol you see with paramedics. On the lower half, that's the flag, the obelisk, the sacred lake, and the temple. Now, in the temple complex at Karnak and all temple complexes in Egypt and along the Nile and Sudan and the others, you had a sacred lake where the priests would go to bathe themselves and to uh, purify themselves. There's where you would, hold it now, there's where, let's go back. There's where you would go for your baptismal. You'll see these structures are the temples. Now, look at this temple complex. You see the sacred lake? You see the, the temple and you see the obelisk. Those three structures, you're gonna see repeated throughout the world. So you know where they come from. You see what Washington DC they did? Benjamin Banneker, the African who designed it, was part of the Brotherhood and he had knowledge of what came out of Egypt. So he, re he designed Washington, D.C. essentially the same as any Egyptian temple. Lincoln's Memorial is the temple. What you call the wading pool is the sacred lake. And George Washington Needle is the obelisk. And it was always near water because the temples was connected to the Nile. Okay? Now you know that story of how you get the, the, the obelisk. When Set killed his brother Osiris, cut him up into 14 pieces, they found all but one his penis, eaten by the Nile catfish, his wife Aset erected a memorial to him to, so that Set in the world would not, will not forget the loss of his phallic, his penis, or the symbol of resurrection. Any obelisk, any steeple on your church, any steeple on your mosque, the minaret of the, ma, of the Muslim, the minaret, the tall structure you do your calling, that's the obelisk, Osiris's penis. Any steeple on your church or, men, or synagogue, that's this symbol. You are now, we're going to the Valley of the Kings. This is the funerary temple of Ramesses II, what you call your funeral home. But this is a funerary temple where the body was prepared for the Pharaoh. This is me showing next to the statue of Ramesses II. And here is more of the complex over to the right, next to show you what Doc always wanted to illustrate to you, that here is the arch structure that was built by the workmen who built this temple, and this is where they stayed. The point that Doc wanted to make was that the Romans never built an arch first. Here is the funerary temple of Hatshepsut, about 1500 BC. It's in three layers. And look at the architectural masterpiece that your architects did, that they still copy and all over the world they come to Africa for the model. This is a funerary temple. Now we're going into the Valley of the Kings where we buried our pharaohs deep under the ground 300 miles down from Egypt, from Cairo and Luxor or Waset. You see the burial chamber, how it went down on the top deeper? And this just gives you a top view of how complex they were. Tutankhamun had a small double chamber wasn't much bigger than half of this stage. The, the kings who, who ruled for a long time had burial chambers that went as much as 300 feet deep and extremely elaborate. So if you could imagine that what they took out of Tutankhamun, a couple of hundred, can you imagine the tens of thousands of things that were taken out of the large one, much of it in the Egyptian mu museum in, in London. Here's a pharaoh dealing with Osiris. Osiris is the god of resurrection. 
He appears as white because he's dead, but he appears as green for resurrection, and the Pharaoh's coming to deal with him. Here is the Pharaoh would be buried deep into that chamber, and he would be put into a sarcophagus using that term. On the top of the ceiling above him, he would always get to see the goddess Nut, the sky goddess. So they buried you with your woman overlooking you, your wife overlooking you to protect you. Up in each of the burial chambers, up in this corner here, everyone had this. You may recognize it as the zodiac, Taurus and, and, Ice and, and Pisces and all of the things you say. It started in Africa and when every pharaoh, they put the zodiac or the constellation of the stars to tell the time. So that if you were to look at these same constellations, go to Egypt and we look in the northern sky, locate each of these stars and map them. Compare them to the position of the stars in this pharaoh's tomb and you will see the, how little they have changed. That change in position dates them back. So in every tomb, they had a calendar. They used the stellar calendar. So now you know how we use the third thing to navigate. You had boats, you had the sextant, and we already laid out the star. Okay, we go on. We move on. Just showing you the number system again, one and 10. Number system again, all of the numbers, tens, base 10. And to show you that you, you invented the ordinal numbers. Look at this symbol of infinity. We had already been dealing with higher mathematics, calculus, infinity, and uh, the functions. All of what you are learning in college were taught in these universities throughout Asia and Africa. This is just showing you the Egyptians had three months of the year. Again, to show you that they, they moved from the stellar calendar to the solar calendar, 365 days to one day. That calendar you use is about five to 10,000 years old. This is showing you bricklaying. Look at the top sequence where you see the brothers and come in with the bricklaying. You invented bricklaying, the mastery of laying bricks that most people in the world use today. And then they tell you you can't be part of uh, the, uh, this little system here. You invented bricklaying. Without bricklaying, nobody would know how to lay bricks. We're not talking, not only understand the, the science of the mortar and cement. Here is the brothers with the architect to the right, and now you begin to see how the skill, labor of the artisan were used to carve out these huge stones, and you would have other skilled artisans who would do the, the minute carvings of the alphabet and language on the wall. There were no slave labor here. People coming from Asia with sheep couldn't, didn't know how to use steel tools and precise instrument, grinding irons and grinding sandpaper, nonsense. That's why they don't have an analysis of it. Here is the unfinished obelisk where we went up into the stone mountains around Aswan. We chiseled out the obelisk. We used steel drills to chisel hole along a line, wooden pegs in there, wet the pegs. The pegs would swell and crack along the line. We knew solid geometry. I'm just going to go through quickly. Look at the temple complexes you built. There are none like this in Greece yet, Rome. There's none like this in um, uh, Asia yet. These temple, these walls are like 15 stories high. You invented and gave the word architecture. This is showing you the inside interior of the temples. We're colored red, white, and blue. That's why they, they adapted red, white, and blue here. There were many colors, but red, white, and blue were the main colors, and purple was a, uh, uh, one of the royal colors. Again, red, white, and blue. You see how they copied and used it for the flag of America and others? Everybody copies from the symbols of Africa. This is showing you the actual comparison so that you'll see that somebody just didn't draw a fantastic picture. This is the temple complex at Dendera, where they chiseled out all of the faces. The point is another type of your temple complex. These are medium-sized temples. Showing you more of the architectural structure. Showing you the two holes up, to your le up in the top of the slides where they put the pegs for the wooden doors to shut it closed. The top of the temple complex. These temple complexes are fitted in stone. They still cannot move these stones today. Next. More of the temple complex. Ramesses II, probably the greatest pharaoh of uh, Egypt. They say he's an Egyptian. 
But yet he comes from where? Nubia. Well, you know, there's no, dif there's no distinction. Here is his one to the left of him is the temple for his most fa favorite right, Nefertari. And as Dr. Ben gives us some information, she was one of the most powerful women there in terms of her control. She controlled the southern party, controlled the north. Here is the god Horus. The father is symbolized, the male is symbolized by the sunburst, okay? The bird, Horus, comes in, we come, the way we develop gods is we come in the form of humans, half humans, and animals. So Horus, the son, comes in the form of a hawk. The father, the male component of God, comes in the form of the son. And you notice on each of his talons, he has the key of life. Next. So what do the white people do? Not coming out of caves and not having anything. They take the Horus and they put it as a symbol of the presidency of the United States. Every country, including Germany, all of them, that uses an eagle or a hawk, uses your God, Horus. And you see what they did? They took the sunburst and then they took the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, what do you call it, symbol for peace. Let's go back again. And then they took, let's go again to the front, and they took the arrows. Each of them symbolized the, the 13 colonies. But again, without African people, they have nothing. Here is your ankh, the key of life. You, wait, let's hold it now. This same ankh you will find as the fertility doll in, Af in West Africa. The top part is the female's uterus. The bottom part is the male penis, and either side is the boy and child, the family. Showing you the Temple of Abydos, as Doc said, the first pilgrimage place that people throughout the world would come here long before there was a Mecca or a Jerusalem. We're going into the second tier inside, and we're going to go very quickly. Here's the creation scene. You want to know in all your Bibles? Where to get the creation scene? The God creating the earth and the heavens out of primordial water and he's bringing in the sun? Here's where you get your creation story from, right? This is what they put in the Bible. And here is Goddess Nut, held up by, oh, no, Goddess Nut, let's go back, held up by God's shoe. She's stabilized by God Geb. Now, Goddess Nut is the heaven. And in the first day, God made the heavens. God is new. And then the next day he made the ear. God is shoe. And then the next day he made Geb. God is the, the firmament. All they were doing was taking this story and repeating it. This is your creation story of the earth. The heavens, the air, and the earth. Here is God canoe. Now that, now that you have created existence, you now will create the actual earth and the sun. You now further must go to the next level by creating man. So God Kanum made man on his potter's wheel and blew breath of life into him. Here is the actual carving on the wall of the, the, the birthplace of the gods. Here's God as Kanum making man on his potter's wheel. All you religious people, we all are religious, just remember it all comes from your motherland regardless of what you call it. If it makes a difference to you to rename it, and don't have loyalty to the continent, your wife, your girlfriend, and your children, then you miss the boat. Let's go through the God. Down the middle, every God had a goddess, and every goddess had a God because we made our God act like us, like same people with opposite sex, no homosexuality. So here's God, Ptah, in the middle. With his gods, Nut, they had a son, God Inhotep. The goddess of medicine is the son of them. And with his god Sekhmet, he had god Atmer. So every god had a goddess. And they had sex and they had children. That's how you know in all of the theology and mythology and religion and life, homosexuality didn't, wasn't tolerated. Here is number of gods. Let's go through quickly. Let's, let's go back. One more slide. God is best, oldest. Time element. God is my aunt, that brother uh, Maddox tell you, Goddess Ma'at is the goddess of justice. That's where the scale come from. His ancestors and ours gave the world law. God got his best law. Here's God men with his large penis for fertility. Telling you how you get babies. Not no homosexuality. Here's goddess Hed Heru or Hathor. 
who comes in the form of an African with cow's ears, an African with horn, or as the, as the cow. That's who you worship as your golden calf in the Bible, an African woman, Hathor, and how the, the Buddha and, the, and those in Asia worship the sacred cow. You are still worshiping this woman. We're going to follow our African woman, Het Heru, to trace her through Asia. The golden calf for Christian, Muslims, and Jews, you're worshiping that goddess, golden calf. And as, if you are Hindu or Buddha, you're worshiping the sacred cow is that woman, our ancestor. Here's goddess Tahuti for recording, Kepra, and goddess Ra, son. We go on, again, family, the always structured family. Here's goddess Nut with Amun Ra, they had a son, Kinsu. Then God set and his wife, uh, Het, uh, um, Netep, they had a son, Ample. He is the one who takes you under. He is the so-called bad God who killed his brother. Then we go to the lay, last family tree. God is getting new, the earth and the sky. They will give birth to two of their children, Asar and Aset. And Dr. Ben tells us they have another child that they don't deal with here is Mindalusi, the one who comes from Sudan. They will have a son called Horus. He will have four sons. This is critical because this is going to be the personage Asar is going to be for the Christian Muslims and Jews Jesus, excuse me, Joseph. For the Christian Muslim Jews, Aset is going to be Mary. And for the Christian Muslim Jews, their son, Heru, is going to be Jesus. That's where you get your story from. Okay, we move on. Here is that female goddess. Any one of you African women coming in the form of an African with cow's ears, cow's horns, or cow. Het, Heru, or Hathor, the one who nursed Heru or Jesus. She's equivalent to Martha who... who breastfed Jesus. We go on. Here is Hathor chiseled. Now she has the form of the cow's ears. You saw her as the horn, the cow's ears. Here you have Het Heru in the form of a cow. Here is the, the female Het Heru. Here is the male, the son of this. And here is, the, here is Hatshepsut nursing. Hatshepsut said she was by immaculate conception. Just remember we're going to follow Hathor. Because she's the one of the oldest female gods. Here is the Pharaoh. The three, th three you see is the symbols of his power. Just in case you would not listen to his civilian power, he was given the sickle to cut your head off to put the force behind his rule. Then here's the symbol for his throne and his, um, his, 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 his garment for his brotherhood. The altar that he was the head of the state of the religion, has his throne, and he was also the chief and commander of the army. Familiar? Miller's civilian rule, he uses the force if he has to, his authority, his brotherhood affiliation, he's the head of the church, he's the king on the throne, and he's the commander in chief of the army. That's where they get it from. Here is the Pharaoh to your left, and his wife, and in between is Hathor. There is no separation between church and state. He's the Pharaoh, she's his wife. She's the pharaoh, he's the husband. Make a difference. That, what you just saw, is the, the executive branch of the government. Anybody who uses a president, a prime minister, that's where they got it. So you gave the world government. You're looking at the priesthood, which is your legislative branch of government. You go on, you see the tree of life. Here is your covenant. The, the agreement you made between you and God, long before there's no Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddha, Hindu, the religions don't exist at this point. Here is, you are died. You want to be resurrected, and you have to take the trip to the sunboat, but you have to eventually deal with who? Osiris, in the judgment scene, with his wife and his sister-in-law. On this side here, you see a man who's died, and he's being resurrected, long before Lazarus did it. On the left side, what is happening? His soul is going up the ladder to heaven, where you get your Jacob's ladder from. We go on. This is the double thing that we, the real thing we gave the world in addition. You are looking at the judgment scene, and this is the foundation for the legal system that everybody in the world uses. The person has died. He's being brought in by Anubis. His deeds are going to be weighed against the feather of truth. Here's God as Ma'at, the justice scale. Tahuti is recording. 
the, bab, the a set with a, a mind with an eye is looking at the scales. Here is your jury to be judged. If you pass and said the, the, if you could say the 42 negative confessions, let's go to the next slide. What did you have to say? The 42 negative confessions of which you get your 10 commandments. They're in your Bible, but you only know about 10. Go back. Now that you're in the judgment scene, if you have not passed, you have not done good in your life, what would happen to you? You could either be eaten up by the monster or let's go two slides ahead. You could be cast into the lake of fire or what you call hell. We go back two more. So you have given the world not only that whole concept of being dead and re resurrected and being reborn. Now let's say you have passed. The jury will rule on you and you will be taken into the judgment hall. The judge's chambers by Osiris. And who's there backing him up? His wife, Aset, and his sister, in, sister and sister-in-law, Nebtep. Behind every man is a woman. If you think the man is going to make it without a woman, you can forget it. Here, let's go quickly before we go on. I mean a good African woman. Let's go back two more. Now, where's your legal system? Here are you. Here is your defense and your prosecutor. Here is your recording secretary. Here is your uh, man with the weapon to keep you, keep you from going any place. Here is the recording secretary. Here's your jury, and you enter the judge chambers. So what they did was they used their legal system to illustrate for those who couldn't read the net of nature how the judgment scene would go. So you gave the world the entire judicial system, as Brother Maddox said. We move on. Now, what happens? You are now coming to judgment. You're coming in front of Osiris in the judgment hall. So what do you do? You have to come up on the great scales in front of Osiris. It's coincident that the Pope and all cardinals seem to dress exactly like Osiris. They all call themselves the new Osiris. They want you to worship in front of a white Jesus, but yet the Pope goes in front of a black woman. Okay, now, go, let's go back to that scale. So you're sitting here in front of Osiris, the judgment, and you have nine judges. That's where you get what? Move on. Supreme Court. Now here's the actual picture of it on the wall in the tomb. The nine judges, here's where you going in front of Osiris. And what did they do to Thurgood Marshall? No disrespect. Thurgood Marshall was taken up the steps, past the nine judges to be sit in front of who? Osiris. They didn't bring him in front of Jesus or Jehovah, or Allah, they brought him in front of Osiris, but the white man didn't tell you what he was doing. Here is the actual, actual carving within the temple of Setai one of Osiris sitting on his throne for judgment, backed by his wife, Aset. Here is Osiris. He's, he's, he's been killed by his brother. He's assisted by his wife and his son, Heru. They are attempting to resurrect him. Here's where you get your resurrection from, in the form of a penis, to give the sperm for new life, because he was killed, and three days later in a cave in Ethiopia, he will roll a stone away to ascend to the right-hand side of God. So Dr. Ben takes us back to show you the resurrection. All of these are concepts that you will give to the world. Here is the Immaculate Conception. Here's Osiris with his penis with the sperm. His wife, Aset, comes in the form of a bird, picks up the sperm. That's where you get this thing about somebody, the ghost came in and impregnated Mary. The ghost was Aset. So here is Osiris, the man, with a penis and sperm, inseminating into the vagina of this bird, his wife, Aset, in the form of a bird. She will now fly over, and you see it on the inside. She will transform herself into the woman pregnant. God, a female God and a son. That's where you get your trinity from. We're going through the, uh, the time period of Egypt to take you back to show you that 
mankind began, number one, two, three, and four, and worked his way up the Nile. He also worked down into South Africa, which Dr. Bin says is not Azania, the oldest name he uses is Mona Matapa, and into West Africa, all the same. Showing you some of what we call Egypt and Nubia as we deal with it. Here is showing you the, that they have found seeds that are at least 8,000 BC. You don't find any evidence of domestication of plants any earlier in Africa. They don't have it anywhere near in Iraq. See what they do in your Bible, they try to push you to Asia. See they can't talk, tell you the Bible's in China. They can't deal with Europe. So to get it out of Africa, they push it into Asia and make up the story. Okay, look at the symbols to reaffirm what it is that the Nubians and Ethiopians were dealing with before they gave birth to the Egyptians. So remember, Egypt, Egypt isn't the beginning, it's the zenith symbol. He's writing. You gave the world writing. Papyrus, paper, ink. Here's Horus. Here's the sickle and hammer that the Russian used. Here is the, God, uh, the sunburst the Japanese used. Everybody used this symbol. Here's a short statued African. Here's the, the right and left eye of Horus, which you call the moon and the sun. Here's the wing, solar disk, the father and the son that you see where these uh, airline pilots wear this. Plus, you'll see it all through Asia. You'll see the origin. Here's the scale. And finally, up there, the male testes, the female uterus, a sperm with a penis with sperm coming out of it, a pregnant woman, a woman delivering baby, nursing. They told you how it was done. No Adam and Eve, that's not your story. Somebody's playing some trick with you. Just to show you that Nubia precedes Egypt. Nubia is what you call Sudan. Precedes Egypt, documented proof. Precedes Egypt. It came down the Nile. Here's Aset, this is, excuse me, Het Heru, the cow's ears, uh, Nubia. Showing you what was in Nubia before Egypt. You're looking at Nubia preceding Egypt. There's God, Ma'at. Same thing. The pharaohs of Nubia. See, let's go back for a second. Dr. Ben reminds you, all Africans don't have big nose and big lips and kinky hair. We come all variation without any mixtures. So we got thin nose, thin lip, straight hair, like you see in East Africa, and you're still African. So don't let them uh, sell that to you. These are pharaohs of Nubia, excuse me, of Nubia or Sudan. But Ramesses II was from Sudan. He didn't have as heavy of features. So many of the pharaohs, aha, the first one. So don't get confused with that, that if you don't have thick nose, thick lips, and woolly hair, you're not an African without mixture. Tahaka, one of the great pharaohs of Nubia, showing you some of the Nubian brothers with our famous Clemson Brown video and as usual. We're going into room 44 in the Egyptian museum, the Nubian room that they don't want you to visit. Dr. Ben said that they may have moved it. We're in Nubia, before Egypt, 5,000 years BC, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000. Look at, look at, go back to that slide for a second. Look at the crowns, gold crowns, bracelets, earrings, necklaces. Now we're about at least six to 7,000 BC, what you were doing. The horse, the saddlebag, the bridle, the machete, at least 6,000 BC. What were you using six to 8,000 BC? Steel hatchets, pliers, chisels, shovels. This is steel now, iron mixed with, with another is steel. There's your hatchet, there's your saw, your pliers, your chisels, your shovel. Here's your balance scale. Here is your, I won't call it asbestos, They're your, your heat retardant gloves. So when you dealt in the steel, uh, the hot in metal industry. Your colander to, to strain your rice. The wok that cook your food. Another innovation you will take to China, the wok. Go back there for a quick second. You see, what you have to do with Maddox and Dr. Ben and others in these organizations will begin to teach you how to get back to regaining what is yours, the land and our minds. There's the wok, the pressure cooker, the, the coolie hat that you always think came from Asia, okay, the dice, 
We're going to touch very quickly into South America and Central so that you'll understand that those Aztecs and Incas had something to do with you, as Van Sertiman tells you. There's the Step Pyramid of Saqqara. Showing you, you have you seen this many times from Van Sertiman's book, the, the Almanac Head, the Kings of Ancient 2000 BC with the braids. And you know how we traveled across with trade. Showing you some of the elders in Central America. Now, I'm not saying they're African. You just take a look and go for yourself. Go back one slide. The point I want to show you that up in America, they had equally these civilizations in America, Mexico and stuff, but they destroyed them. God, God is best in Central and South America. Showing you that the indigenous person they murdered, many of them was dark as any one of you. We're going to sweep across Asia. We're heading towards the South Pacific. Let's deal with the Bible. Two seconds. In your Bible, if you believe the scheme, they said who was the descendants of Ham? The black people. And your Bible says who were the black people? The Egyptians? The Arabians? Almost everybody in Western Asia? And the Phoenicians? So your Bible says, if you're Muslim, Christian, or Jews, your Bible, if you believe it, says, that the people of Egypt and Africa, Saudi Arabia and the whole area were black. So in the school system, they tell you the Egyptians were white. Then when you go to your temples, mosques and synagogues, they tell you the Egyptians, now I, wait, I got this backwards. They tell you the Egyptians are white in school. But in the, your Bible tells you they're black. No one ever mentions that. So you see the, the double trick that they play on you. The school system, they're white. In the church, the religious house, they're black, but no one analyzes it. So if you believe the scheme, then the people of Africa, including the Egyptians, the Nubians, the Sudanese, the Arabs, and even all these white Jews, Shank and the rest of them will keep talking about the Semitic people, the Semitic, he doesn't believe his own book. If he doesn't, if he doesn't understand the scheme according to the way they set it up, we go on. All of the people in your Bible who you identify as Jebusites and Philistites and all of your Bible identify as black people from Ham. Because those people coming from the Caucasus Mountains who will write your Bible came into Western Asia at a time when they were none but black people. And that's why they identify them, including the Phoenicians. So what did these people from Asia do? Just like other white people did to all of us, they came into the area killing people. So in your Bible, when they say they exterminate the seven groups of people, you're talking about somebody coming from the Caucasus Mountains, probably not looking at you, killing off your ancestors. Because remember, this part of the world had been occupied and populated by people of color. The Bible verifies it if you believe it. So that's what happens in your Bible, the genocide and murder of indigenous black people in the area by an outside force. These are the areas of the Phoenicians. Your Bible identifies the Phoenicians as black. But let's go and see the artifact. This is Carthage. You see the, you see the doll of the uh, fertility doll. If you look at the artifacts coming out of Spain, the Phoenicians, who the Phoenicians? You see the artifact of all Egyptians. We go down to Greece. We had time to look. They're all Egyptian. You see goddess Nut right there and all of it. The artifact. Then the same thing here, if you go to Crete and Cyprus, you still see Africa, Africa, Africa. And you go again to Phoenicia, same thing. And again, Israel. Let's use the modern geographical term so you'll understand. Israel, this is what they're digging up in Israel, Egyptian sarcophagus. Here is Western Asia. Where did they get the model from? You see, you see God as I said up there? Where did they get the model from in Western Asia? These are all artifacts from Western Asia. Antiquity, your Bible. Of course they got it out of Egypt. God happy. This is from Western Asia. You see the same pharaoh with the crown of the south and the north, with the wings of Horus, the line of the body. That's why they talk about it religiously, but they don't show you. What were, what were the people in Western Asia worshiping at the time of the invasion of these Asians call themselves Jews or whatever you want to call them. They were worshiping the god Baal. Who were they worship? The golden calf, Het Heru. That's who they were worshiping, and the goddess, god Baal. Baal is the equivalent of Osiris. Western Asia. So this is Iraq, Iran, 
Syria, this is what they're digging up. God got his best in Western Asia. Here is the Stella coming from along the border of Phoenicia, what you call Syria now. You see the God and you see the wing. Sun disk. There's Het Heru. This is coming from Israel, but they're digging up from Israel. Who conquered the area? Who was it under, under whose control was it? It's obvious. This is the Solomon temple that some of you love. A temple built by, according to your Bible, Phoenicians. So your Bible and your religious book, the Koran, identify the people who built Solomon temple as Phoenicians, quote unquote Africans. They built, wait, no, let's stay back for a second. They built Solomon's temple. Because it was way up away from the water, you had to have a sacred lake, so they built a large vase. And who can guess what this is? Osiris's penis, the obelisk. So what they did was took an Egyptian temple, architecturally Egyptian temple, built by African people, using African religion, renaming it. That's what you're worshiping. Here's an archaeological, this is a, a schematic diagram of, the, of Solomon's temple. It's a small temple, one of thousands built in that area by Africans, nothing special. But the white man, in order to pull you away from Africa, he's the one pull up Solomon's temple like Solomon was somebody, some minor king in Asia, killing people. And here is this temple, the, the Solomon's temple, go back for a second because so many brothers love it, still don't know that it's an African temple. Go back one more shot. This temple was only 300 feet long and three stories high, four stories high. Let's go back, go up for it quickly. Whereas the master temple, the, the Grand Lodge I sent, none of you want to hold it, go back, want to deal with, is 1,500 feet. Five times as long, three times as tall. Got back to your African. Here is who you go to the Fertile Crescent where it's supposed to start at. But yet you will find them worshiping who? Goddess Het Heru. And what will you find? You're going to find the same Hammurabi and all of these people, the originators of civilization, copying what the Egyptians did. You notice, this is now, we are now in your Bible, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the this one, and the that one. Who were they? Still riding chariots out of Africa? There's Horus up here, still the same duplication from Egypt. These are, these are thousands of years beyond, after Egypt. Look at the same Pharaoh. Here's Osiris, sitting on his throne. And here is Horus. Remember his son brings you to him? Horus is the wing. So here's Horus, here's you, and here's Osiris. The same hand as in Egypt. Direct copy. And who is the Babylonian king in your Bible worshiping? Who's on the throne with the cows there, as you see it? The Babylonians and the Syrians and all the Asians worship God Het Heru, the same one you worship in the golden calf. You never stamped it out and you're not going to. This is Persia. Who did the great Persians emulate? You see the temple complex. But what symbol did they use to guard the whole structure? You see Horus? The wing, Horus, with the god. Right there again. Let's drop into Greece before we move into Asia and the South Pacific. This is the Acropolis, for those who are Greeks. The Parthenon. But if you examine the Parthenon, which will come thousands of years after these temples, notice the Parthenon is a small Egyptian temple. Look at it. And what did they have in front of it? A bull. You know what this bull is? It's the, the Nile Valley Apis bull. The Minerva bull, the same bull of Brahmin you're going to see in, in Asia. So the Egyptian, so for those who are Greek, they come thousands of years after these temples. It's a small Egyptian temple copied with still the Apis bull and the Minerva bull right there. Direct copy from Egypt. Here is part of the complex with African women. And look at the women who's holding up part of the complex. The thick nose, heavy braids, still African women. And who is the Parthenon, the highest of the Greek temples honor to? Athena. Goddess Athena is goddess Het Heru or Hathor renamed.
Okay, we, we about two-thirds finished and we're moving. We've got one more slide and a half. So the point is, as we move towards the South Pacific and to get into it, you must understand that your greatness gave the world all of this. And that of the hundreds of thousands of years of history, we lost power for a very short period of time because of the use of gunpowder and others. So we must do whatever we have to to regain it. Okay, we're coming across Asia very quickly. Let's show you who lives in Asia now. I'm telling you, not only the South Pacific, but Asia is a continent of black people. Doesn't exist this yellow business. Black people, people of color. Saudi Arabian, Prince, Oman in the right hand, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. The Prince of Saudi Arabia, King Banda, who comes here, to the, uh, the ambassador to the United Nations is a brother. Clinton deals with a brother. Whether the brother thinks straight or not, he's a brother. Kuwait. They run the full mixture in Kuwait. Whether they're thinking or right, you see who they are. Oman, that's on the southern tip of Saudi Arabia. Pakistan, purpose of showing you a slide so you can get a pretty good idea. Yes, they'll say they have light-skinned Pakistanis, light-skinned Indians, and it's all true. The point is that the people who make the base people of India, Pakistan, are these people that you see. Here is your Dravidian, who makes up in some accounts 10, to as much as 30% of the population. The largest group of people outside of the Africa, there are 5 billion people on Earth, presently they say. 2 billion are African. So we make up 40% of the world's population. Of the 2 billion, 1.5 billion of us live on a continent of which they're trying to kill with AIDS. 500 million of us live outside the continent approximately. Of the 500 million that live outside, mo the largest group of Africans outside the continent is in India call the Dravidians, at least 200 million. The second largest concentration of us is in Brazil, and we in America in the third. Okay, we move on. Next. Showing you Indians, all kind of Indians, but we're going to concentrate on the Dravidians. To show you the present presence of Africans in India. Remember, the Africans originally populated the Indus Valley and what is India, Burma, Burma, thousands of years and tens of thousands of years ago. And in the literature, they say there's another group of Aryan people who came from the north. So the original people of India in this area, they call them Adivasi, the people of the beginning. Show you a close up of some of the brothers with the dread still there. Now, India. Now, you notice the Taj Mahal. It happens to be a duplicate of the Egyptian temple system. There's the temple, here's the wading lake, and the minarets are the, are the uh, obelisks. So you see who was in India doing the architecture. India, you brought the chariot. You brought the papyri, paper, ink, writing, calligraphy. Uh, God, God is best in India. Here is uh, Yashoda and Krishna. Yash Krishna is Jesus. Yashoda is the equivalent of Het Heru or Martha who nursed Jesus when I set had to go away and Mary had to go away. This is the, so what you get the scheme is this. The oldest of it is Osiris and Aset had a son, an older son called Horus and this son called Horus, this is Horus. For the Christian Muslim and Jews, Osiris is Joseph, Aset is Mary, James, Horus the elder is James the lesser, that was Jesus' oldest brother, and Horus is Jesus. So when you love Jesus, you love Horus. The woman who, or the female relative who nursed Horus was Het Heru. The one who nursed Jesus was Martha. For the, for the Hindus and the Buddha, it's Vasuda is Osiris, the Vaki is Aset. They had an older son called Belarama, and the younger son is Krishna, and he was nursed by Yashoda. The Vaki had a brother, Osiris had a brother, Set, who killed him. Chris, Kamsha did the same thing. The point is, I'm showing you the parallel. That without what came out of the Nile, you wouldn't have the structure you call Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism. We're going across Asia. Bangladesh. Sri Lanka. There is Buddha. That, that personage you call Buddha is equivalent to Jesus. So it's Horus. For the Nile, Christian, Muslim, and Jews is Jesus. For the Indians, it's in Hindu Indians, it's Krishna. And now for those who will take up Buddha, that same personage becomes Buddha. Thick nose, thick nose. Wait, let's go back for a second. Sri Lanka.
There is the Buddha, there's the genetics of the people, there's the architectural structure. Going across Asia, going to Russia. This shows you where the white people live in what is called Russia, the U Union, the Soviet Social Republic. The white people began hundreds of years ago from Moscow to begin to steal the land from the dark-skinned people of Asia. The same thing that the whites did to us in Africa, they did to people in America. The Eastern European whites began to expand in the a direction of Asia. So they took land from everybody. These are the maps. Keep moving. This is just documenting how white Russia got all this land. They conquered it. They killed people. So that white Russian, let's go back, keep on going. So you had two centers of power. You had white America and white Russia. But because white Russia has disintegrated, you have gotten rid of half of your problem. What, go back to the slide again. All of these you see here represent the 14 republics that broke away. White Russia was stealing food and resources from all of these people to make Moscow rich, just like the white man do to you here. Because all these republics broke up and Moscow has lost control over them, now the white Russians are starving. Germany and America had to give it food. When they broke up, this Republic of Kusistan was the, was, was the Asian of all the republic, the only republic, Asian republic that was left with atomic weapons was Kusistan. So you now have Kusistan which has over 2,000 atomic weapons. You know the white man is always trying to stop everybody from getting nuclear weapons so that he can intimidate you. But now some Muslim, uh, darker-skinned people got some atomic bombs and missile delivery system, and now they're saying that some of it may, have be, it may be transferred to Iran and Iraq, and maybe the next Persian Gulf War will be a little different. Here is the... the rep now that all of these have broken away from right, white Russia, these areas in the Federation of Russia now are breaking away. So the oil region that Moscow is going to lose, the diamonds, the gold, the platinum, and the timber, and none. So once when these areas break away, what you call Gorbachev or Yeltsin is going to be a fifth-rate power. So now it's the United, white United States that's got to stand alone trying to hold down the Chinese, the Indians, the, the, the Koreans, and the Africans. Kusistan. Afghanistan, just to show you the color of the people, that they're non-white, they're not Gorbachev, and this is who they had under it, Kusistan. Kusistan is twice the size of Alaska. This is where white Russia was eating out of. 50 million acres of wheat, corn, and soybean was going north to the white Russians. They took all of their oil, and the Russian rocket center is in Kusistan. They cut them off so Russia can't shoot up any more missiles. That's why they're hooking up with America. You've got to study some of these things. Bhutan, Nepal, Tibet, no yellow people yet. The western quarter of China, Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, Vietnam. Here's Burma. Show you one sister in Burma. Here are these small little islands south off of India and Burma, now controlled by India, called the Adaman Islands. Who lives on them? Who used to live on them and still live on them? short statured Africans called Twa from Central Africa. There is one brother. And let's see the pictures. You see some, some men from India or Pakistan, and you see how short they are? These are your Hutu and your Twa from Central Africa, thousands of years ago, that are still left in Asia, and they're still in the bush in India, they call themselves the Aravasi and others. They're there. Thailand, the king of Thailand. In 1850, what is an African doing as the king of Thailand? Why? Because the Buddhas of Thailand are African. Here's the Buddhas of all Buddhas, all Buddhas in Asia are African. Then they started uh, making them different, but they all had naughty hair, thick nose, thick lips. So Buddha is that personage of Horus or Jesus, an African. Now you're looking at the Buddhas of Thailand. Cambodian, many of them as dark as anybody here, if not darker than most of you. Cambodian. Cambodian. Now you see why the Cambodians, look at the beautiful sister. You see the architectural structure of Asia, 
what you call Cambodia and Laos, all Angle Wat. What is it? The same temple complex modeled after the Step Pyramid of Saqqara and the pyramids and the same water system. Egypt, temple, sacred lake, obelisk. You see, when you came into the, the uh, Grand Lodge, you have to come through a line of men. Same architectural structure. This is, China, this is Cambodia. We're showing you the comparison to Egypt. You see where you laid it out in Cambodia. Back to Cambodia where you've got to come in through the temple complex, the double row on each side with the, with the temple complex and the statue above. Go back to Egypt. You see the same row coming in. And you see the, the African there as the god Buddha. Close up. In Vietnam, in the mountains, you have black people. They're called mountain yards. African people still in Vietnam, and these were the people the United States were trying to get to fight the Vietnamese. The Buddhas of China. Now, you notice around each Buddha there's a halo. That halo is the sunburst of Ra. You see if any, any saint that has a sunburst, that's Ra. China, Buddha. Up close of the Buddhas you brought to China. Korea, just to point out to you whether you like them or not, that Koreans, as a general rule, are people of color, got some color to them. Buddhists of Korea. Buddhists brought into Japan. We're going into, the, we're going into the South Pacific. Now, we're coming off the mainland into the South Pacific. You have Indonesia, Malaysia, Timor, which the Indonesians now conquer. You have the uh, Philippines, Taiwan. Or, excuse me, you're coming into, you're coming into South, coming off the mainland of Asia into the island. Indonesia, Malaysia, Timor, which is conquered by the Indonesians now. Philippines, Taiwan, all people of color. When Chiang Kai-shek invaded Taiwan, there were no Chinese there, there were them dark-skinned people there. Malaysia. The point is to show you there are no yellow people here, they're melanated people. The temple complex in Indonesia, the same step pyramid, the same pyramidal structure. The Buddha of Indonesia, sunburst of Ra, the nadi here and the pineal gland that the Indians wear that come out of Africa symbolizing the inner pineal gland. We're coming into the South Pacific. You got people of the South Pacific. Now you're going into Papua New Guinea. It was first of the South Pacific that Dr. Ben lived and working and brought us information. You're beginning to see who lives in the South Pacific. These are the short statured Africans still in the South Pacific. They're in Central Africa, they're in India, they're in the Adaman Islands, in Malaysia, they're in Indonesia. They're all over the place because they're originators and they still exist. Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands. Now you're in what you call the, the, the people of the Pacific, Africans of the Pacific, the Solomon Islands, jet black. Some of the blackest people in the world are from these islands. There's a genetic variation of blonde. We show the white boy so you clearly see. Uh, Vanuatu, where we live, my wife and myself and my children lived over here working for the government in their medical system. We revisited. These are the people of Vanuatu. They used to be called the New Herbides about the size of New Jersey, 300,000 people, 1,500 miles east of Australia. The Prime Minister of Vanuatu, his wife Mary, this is 1981, his children, this is, my, this is Mary who's here now, my wife, my oldest son who's now in college, and my oldest daughter, Jeanette, and these are the Prime Minister's children. The white man would classify some of us as black, some as, poly he, he called them Melanesian. She is Polynesian, and she's Negro, the crazy white man to divide you so you don't understand what's going on. Here's the first family, the Prime Minister of Vanuatu, his wife, and the six children. This is the typical family you're going to find in any South Pacific country. Austr uh, America took over Hawaii, the English took over Australia, New Zealand, every country lost their independence. They're getting it back, but they all lost it to some white man. Here is Vanuatu during the independence. They, there's the Prime Minister of Vanuatu, the first Prime Minister. They have changed over another Prime Minister, so you'll get an idea who they are. New Caledonia Island, off Australia, under the French control, the size of, of um, Cuba, which has the largest deposit of nickel in the world. Second largest. These islands are rich. S richest, second richest, they're the richest islands 
to the richest area in the world, minerally, second only to Africa. New Zealand, showing you some of the Maori people, the original New Zealanders, using that term. The Maori brothers, show you some of the indigenous people of New Zealand, show you how the European got in. Showing these the original people of Australia, call themselves the Karen people, C-A-R-I-N. Dr. Ben said their folklore traced themselves directly from Madagascar. These will be the people to be the first inhabitants of Japan. Indigenous people of Australia killed everybody down in Tasmania and they tried to reduce the population to nothing. The white man said, if we kill all of you, then you don't have to worry about any of you. Fiji. Fiji, Fijian brothers, my wife, 1981. Fiji, to remind you what the Europeans did to you. Tonga, Rockefeller in Tonga, he'll come back and tell you there's nobody over there and nothing for you. There's the king of Tonga, about 1850. Any one of our grandparents? Keep going. Here is Tahiti that the French took. Hawaii that the Americans took. Here's the king of Hawaii and the family around the time America came in, in 1850. Here's the royal family still existing. The king, he was fighting. Here's the family. You notice that the African people, their hair is a little straight and slick. That's just the way it is. That's the variation. Just like you're naturally blonde, you're naturally redhead, you come to full sprint. Here's Hawaiians. What do they say? Demoralize and depopulate. Hawaiians. John Lewis Stevenson, the white man there, with, a, with one of the kings. The queen, one of the queens at the turn of the century. How they shot their way in. The United States presently took over the Spanish. The Easter Island. If these, you ever seen the Easter Islands in between Tahiti and South America, they said they don't know how these statues got there. That's your ancestral statue. But let's see it. You see the white man showing you how you built in stone on these remote islands, right from the Nile. Stone builders. And remember the obelisk? How you chiseled out the obelisk? You chiseled out the obelisk, but what did you put on the end of it? A face. And you moved it. Still stonemason. We go up to the northern Pacific. Nyam, one of the small islands, typical uh, woman from Nyam. You middle of the Pacific that the white man, the American and the Japanese are fighting over these islands. Nehru. Nehru has one of the largest deposits of phosphates in the world, the president and the dentist and the swimmer and some of the sisters. The South Pacific is like Africa. You've got very sh small people and, and huge people. Uh, brothers and sisters, some the men run 350 to 400 with no fat and the women run, women run a little bigger. She's a testament to it. Cook Island. New nations being born. This is the Philippines. The small statued African in the southern Philippines, who we call a twa, that went into the Philippines. Is, they call them the Negritos. That's why most of the people from Southeast Asia and the Philippines are short statued from the ancestry of the twa. So this is, a, they call them the Negritos, the short statued African, the Manubos and others in, in the Philippines, they're short statue. They're the Tuhutu and Twa still present. There's the Moros. We're coming up to Japan. They're showing you the original inhabitants of Japan, the Ainu. The Ainu were, were uh, Africans coming from Australia, calling themselves the Karen people, and they're attempting to show you the different racially. This is the original, and this is what came later. They're showing you in the watercolor of Japan how the African was there and greeting them. And this is where you get the samurai when the Japanese were killing you off. There are two cities called, go back one quickly, there's two cities called Kyoto and Nara. These are the two cities that you establish as the center of civilization for Japan. And the Japanese tell you, the people who brought architecture, engineer, law, karate, etc., were the people who brought and set up these cities. And who are these people? They're the same people who brought Buddha. Now let's see who Buddha is that the Japanese worship in their religious houses. We go on, and that's Buddha. Of the National Archives of, of Japan in Kyoto, where they have all of their national archives, this is who they worship as their Buddha. Idi Amin. We go on, Dr. Ben in Papua New Guinea. 
They're showing you the craft shop in Papua New Guinea. Showing you the, the craft of the brotherhood. You see the grandmaster. And what does he have on his head? Horus. We're coming along the University of Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinean feeding, his, feeding her, her son. Some of the Papua New Guineans fishing. Brothers in the highland. Other brothers in the highland. We're going from Fiji to Vanuatu. The, the air travel is one of the most common. They're showing you some of the intra-island airlines. So you say, how do they get, a, get across to these islands in these vast vances of water? You're in Vanuatu now. Downtown Vanuatu, 87 after the hurricane. Showing you part of the outskirts of Vanuatu. This is the capital, Port Villa. This is the brothers in the island of Raga in the Vanuatu. Wait now, let's go back for a second. What are they preparing? You see they're preparing a structure. See the structure? What is the brother doing? Bungee jumping. But where did it start? Africa. This is in the South Pacific. This is the first prime minister's homeland, Raga. It started in Africa. And this is one of, the, one of the rituals you brought. In order for you as a man, a male, to go from boyhood to adulthood, your initiation, you had to come down 15 stories, 10 stories, and they calculated out just right. And you see the little brother and the sisters, everybody watching. You had to do it, or you're not going to go into the council of the elders or council of the men, and they, they catch you just as you meet. But let's show you the other part of Vanuatu. There are port facilities. Port facilities. And this is supposed to be an undeveloped country. Some of the housing. Not all housing, but they have a full range of stock. Let's go to the next slide, Carousel, as we wind down. Again, as I, I recommend, if you can get it, is the video so that if you're interested, you have to sit and see the pictures. Because of the necessity of 550 slides, you have to move to introduce. They have what you see. This is a, one of the capital cities I lived in. Marketplace, just like in Jamaica or any other part of the African world. The port facility. Shipping. Uh, modern downtown port, tourism, purchase uh, automobiles via Japan and other industrialized countries, automobiles, copra, cattle, wood. See, these are the islands that countries like Japan have to eat out of. Telecommunications. Uh, downtown hospital. The thing about this picture is that it's a symbol of an African man. And even though most of the people are some form of Christian, they're like other Africans. They still have their indigenous root. And who are their gods? Their god is an African man with a thick beard and a big woolly hair by you, me, stand up long God. So they're Christian with an African god. The hospital, Ministry of Health, University of South Pacific is in English, French, and Bishlama, a national language, because Vanuatu had two colonials at once, the English and the French. University of South Pacific. Boxing. Show you that you do everything you do. Here is my son playing basketball. Of course, you can easily pick him out. And there it is again. It happens to be my son here. And, you know, give the standard five, just how, the way it goes. One of the sisters cooking lap lap. They cook in earth ovens. They cook barbecue and they cook on stove. There's a coconut crab that's found in the South Pacific. They decide about 15 pounds that go up the coconut, cut it, crack it, and drink it. Independence. Show you that they have a military so that they could secure their independence. They had to get troops from Papua New Guinea in order to fight to get the British, the French, and the Americans out of their country. So you're going to have to fight if you want an independence. Here is a, a young student going to school. Uh, school children, this was during the after the hurricane. You see some of the uh, trees down and the natural blonde here, red here. 
two sisters, typical of the junior high school students in Vanuatu. As a general rule, the people of South Pacific just pick the hair, make nice little afro. Here's some more. This is the Prime Minister's sister on the right. She's presently the ministry, Minister of Health. And here is healthy Prime Minister's sister on the right. I work with her in the pharmacy. And her husband is a lawyer. Here is the family that we stay with and work with most closely. It's Daniel, Melissa, his wife, Pauline. They have four children, my son in the middle. This is the typical family of the South Pacific. Any Japanese, any Asians or Europeans you find here don't belong originally. Here's another family. This is the sister you saw in the opening slide presentation. And her husband, Sella, and their children still use the Afro pick just like you. Here is Sella Molisa and his children, the foreign minister, and my wife in 1981. Here is a party at the ch with the children. Another slide, another slide there. Prime Minister's residence. Prime Minister's guard. Prime Minister in 1987, the children are a little older. Now here's when we give the banquet, the hookup with the people of Vanuatu, we use the symbol of the head Prime Minister. And there is their guard, an African man. They use the red, white, and blue, just like we do. And they use the Y for the shape of the country and the tusk of the pig for sustenance and the, the bird of paradise. Keep going. And we give these banquets. This is a banquet we gave about two years ago for the Prime Minister as a cultural link. That's why when you go to Africa and when you do these uh, lectures and stuff, this is a cultural link that begins what you need to work with each other. This is Ambassador Vanuatu, Robert Van Lero. He's the only ambassador of the UN that represents a country that he's not a citizen of. He's an American citizen representing Vanuatu. Of course, you know Dr. Ben. That's my wife, Mary, my friend, Chewbacca, and there's an indigenous person in the middle. We're waiting for the prime minister. We greet him. This is at 143rd Street in Harlem, St. Nicholas Avenue, Harlem School of the Arts, right below City College. We're greeting him in. This is the Secret Service. They send with him a white man. You might say the spy, but this is our Secret Service. Okay, this is, we're at the dinner waiting. Here's the community waiting to welcome them, an African addressed as, as, as we should, from the elders to the children. Some brothers from Detroit. Uh, a, a jazz band is playing. Orby is one of Doc's best friend, a musician who died recently. There's another jazz group that played for the prime minister. See, this is, in, again, the Harlem School of the Arts. If we may begin in the opening presentation. Uh, the ambassador, Van Leerhoef, getting his award. He lives in Harlem. I live in Harlem. Vanuatu's mission's in Harlem. Here's Sister Sybil uh, receiving the award for Dr. Clark. Here is the brother giving Chewbacca from America, giving the indigenous brother his award. And now we're exchanging the educational material that we must exchange the hookup for the cultural link to share information. This is what they don't want. Your enemy don't want the link up. Exchanging information. First, you must start with the cultural affairs so that you can win each other's trust and you can work. Dr. Ben lecturing as usual, guiding us. Dr. Ben getting his award. The Prime Minister speaking. This is a recent article out of the New York Daily News stating that the island Harlem home so they're very concerned that Vanuatu put their mission in Harlem because that shows a commitment to the Harlem and to the black community. It's located on 143rd Street, Common Avenue, right behind the First World, right next to Clark House and right down from City College. They are uh, in the community. And I just use one little thing that the United States said at the time of the independence that they consider Vanuatu the Cuba of the Pacific because they do what's best for themselves. So they featuring this. This is the, the picture of the actual mission of Vanuatu that has been established, and they're there to work with you, and they want the link. That's why we all link up. This is going to touch Europe a little bit, but to show you what you give them, this is God in Hotep that gave the world medicine. Socrates. Lakshman or Aesop, as we named them. The Medici, who's the great, 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 great of the present queen of, of England, who's black. The Moors who civilized Europe, they gave them whatever they need to start them on their renaissance. Dumas, the father, son, and grandfather who gave uh, France their, their uh, 
theater. France, Europe wouldn't be anything without the infusion of African people. Beethoven, who was black, his mother was a Moor. Hitler didn't allow his music to be played because his mother was black and he was black. And Mendelssohn, for another reason here, the, here's the, the prince, the crown prince of Germany. Those Germans, white Germans, who, let's go back for a second. Those white Germans who are killing everybody with color don't know that Maurice of Argonaut, their patron saint of Germany, is a Nigerian with Horus. The worship in the Nigerian don't know it. Pushkin, who made Russia literature what it is, he gave you what you call a nutcracker suite in Swan Lake. That's his, but Tchaikovsky just put the music to it. Showing you the part of Europe they don't want to deal with, and there's a good part of Europe that looks like this. That's why they want to not get out of South Africa and other places. Show you that in Europe there are tremendous conflicts. You got the uh, civil war in England and the Irish. The Basques have their separative war. You know about Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and them in friction. There was a war going on between Russia, Romania, Moldavia, and Ukraine. There are wars all over Europe they don't talk about. Captain Cook went into the Pacific, document that they're beginning to come into your area. And what the English and the French and American, all white people came to the South Pacific and they enslaved you. Like they enslaved the people of Africa and others. They called it black birding. And they did everything they could to kill down as many of you as you can. Let's go back for one second. This is just to show you that the Japanese were fighting over your island. The Japanese would have equally colonized, murdered, and brutalized you equal to the Europeans. They are not your friends based upon their past behavior. The Japanese were after the Koreans and the, and the Chinese for their coal and their manpower, Philippines for their food, Vietnam for their rubber and tin, Indonesia for the oil, Papua New Guinea for the gold, for the copper, the platinum, the lead, Vanuatu for the manganese, New Caledonia for the nickel. They were going to strip us clean. The Japanese and the Europeans fought over Asia to take it all from you. Now Asia is reforming. You're going to have to deal with it. This is called the law of the sea that America and others don't want to deal with because you get too big a share of the wealth of the war of the ocean. Showing you some of the trade routes between Asia and here. America now states that Asia is more important to it in terms of trade and strategy than Europe. And this just shows you the fiber optic system that the, that the Asians, the Indians, the Asians, and Africans in Bell Lab developed the fiber optic system and then the white man used it to hook up Hawaii into Guam, and he was trying to connect all of his areas, but these links aren't going to work. Showing you where he has his military forces placed to protect it. This is a new organization called the Asian Pacific uh, Cooperative Region. What it states is that America and Canada are part of an economic regional grouping that includes China, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, um, Philippines, Japan, and Taiwan. But in this whole economic grouping, guess what? They totally exclude all of the areas that you control. So that you understand their intention. All of the white countries, America dropped the bombs in the Pacific, the French drop them in Tahiti, and the Australians let the, the English drop them in, in Australia. And this is what they're trying to get rid of. They use the Pacific to steal our fish, steal our minerals, drop atomic bomb, and drop, their nuclear, drop all of their waste that come from Europe, they drop it in the ocean. So we got to fight. This is just showing you the sea lanes. Again, the, the importance of the sea lanes. Uh, actual photographic map of Africa, and we almost finished. Let, let's go back for a second. The actual, you see the Congo River, and you see the Nile, and you see the Great Lakes, where we came from. A close-up view of the Nile to show you how deep it goes in. This is showing you the water system of Africa. Africa has 50% of all the hydroelectric power in the world. Wait now. Besides this, let's look, look here. See Somalia? They got plenty of rivers and plenty of food. They're not starving. What is it, what is it that Africa have? Look at the oil. Nigeria, uh, Cameroon, Angola, 
Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, and I'm sorry for this much, over there, Somalia has something United States wants. What does Somalia have? Potash, uranium, oil, fish, and you will see the geographic location that they have here. All of the minerals that come out of Central and South Africa have to come through South Africa. So that whoever controls South Africa controls the mineral wealth of the world and therefore can determine, can shut down any industrial country. United States studies said that if we Africans, when we Africans control South Africa and get rid of Mobutu, Zaire, and get rid of the clerk and anybody else who collaborate, and you control these minerals, you could shut down Japan, Europe, or Russia in six months. Okay? And, you, and they wouldn't even deal with America. So this is the kind of power you, they're talking about. Remember, most of the minerals that most of the industrial world uses come through the final rail system of South Africa. They will kill whoever they have to, to try to hold it, and they will prop up whoever they want, and we will see it as we finalize show you how they drain the minerals from Africa and the food and distribute it among themselves. Keep going. They need nickel to make airplanes as an example. Fabulous riches of Namibia as all African countries. Now, just a quick map to show you this is how all Euro Western European countries got rich. And if it wasn't for the mineral and food wealth that they were taking and still take to some degree, there would be no prosperity in Europe, America, Japan, or any place. This is just showing you that America was the one who financed the guerrilla movement to destabilize Mozambique. That there are hundreds of tens of thousands of white people working in Zaire, but you can't work there. Lumumba would have helped, would have, we could have worked with Lumumba, and he could have helped supply us with jobs and businesses, but Mobutu uses Zaire for America, and the whites benefit from it at this point. Showing you Savimbi, who did not, what, is it, what did the white man say? The people of Zaire, Angola, and Somalia are victim of American war. America uh, funnels aid and, to Savimbi to keep Angola destabilized. See, because Angola is the only country in Africa close enough to South Africa to militarily defeat it, which it did two years ago. The Cuban and the Angolans and the OAU troops defeated the best that the European, English, American, Israeli, and South African, we destroyed them. Because of that defeat, the, the, the deal was made that Cuba and Angola wouldn't push into South Africa, but South Africa had to get one, they had to release, let Namibia become free. That's how they got the independence, even though it's not the best. And the, and the agreement was to let go all political prisoners. So when the whites saw that their back was to the wall, they didn't want to deal with any of you Africans. The Europeans call us niggers, and the whites in South Africa call us coffers. So they started looking for the African in South Africa who they could deal with to sell you out. The largest military base in Africa is in Kamina. American base in Kamina, in the Shaba province that they use with Savimbi to destabilize Angola so Angola can help the freedom fighters in South Africa at this point. The other reason they come in here is they have captured some diamond mines and gold mines. They're digging it out to use to buy weapons because America can't finance these wars anymore. The whites came to South Africa. We gave them food, land, and women. We made the mistake like everybody else. White South Africa says, come and invest, but not for you. You don't want to be part of it. You want to take it all. Let's get something straight. We need African countries, and all countries should start considering following the rule that they have followed in the South Pacific, using Vanuatu as an example. And if the misrepresentation is a little bit, I apologize. When they got their independence, they turned the land back to the people immediately. What they said was that we're going to bring the land back to the state it was before the entrance of the Europeans. So that meant that once when they got the independence by the gun, the English didn't give it to them. Vano Papua New Guinea assured the uh, independence of Vanuatu by the gun. They immediately turned all the land back over to all the people. There's no such ownership of land in Vanuatu and in the South Pacific country by foreign people. No farm. All the mines revert back to the nation. There's no national, no foreign ownership of mines or land. The only one who can be in the government is indigenous people. 
African people. That, that's, that's the only one who can be in it. And the government must be run by the guidance of the great council of elders. So if you follow that model and just say, let's bring the country back to what it was before any foreign invaders, then automatically any scheme anybody come to you with, regardless of what acronym ANC and the West of the left, if they're not talking about the return of the land to the people immediately, if they're not talking about mines coming back to the indigenous people immediately, if they're not talking about a government run only by indigenous people headed by the Great Council, they are selling you out. So we go on, South Africa. The, the certain groups of Africans in South Africa who are clearing the land. What they mean clearing the land is they're getting rid of those people who don't belong on there, putting on who belong. And they're not praying it. The ANC will make their first visit to Israel. Of all of the groups that the whites have identified, and I'm making it my own statement, that if you analyze the documents and what the ANC want, they decided to work with the ANC and sell you Mandela because that's the group that's going to sell you. Mugabe is the president of Zimbabwe. For 10 years, 1% of the white people, 100,000 white people still own one-third of all of the land. All of the mines are still controlled by whites and, the, and the, the banks. You know why? Because instead of fighting it down like Mukoma wanted, Mugabe made a deal with England and France to let the country still stay as a stranglehold. They're trying to get the same thing under Mandela. We go on. Mandela's group join, sees a joint role for whites. Now he don't see a role for you as an African, does he? Is he inviting you over? No, he and the whites are gonna run it. Mandela's shift in strategy offers white in the short share of power. Any of you got assurance of a job or a business in South Africa? but one of the richest countries in the world, he's going to share it with the murderers. Here is the man who has the Brodobund. The Brodobund is the South African equivalent of their secret society, and they tell you point blank, the goal of the Brodobund is to disrupt black life. KKK. Now, this picture was put in the New York Times to let white people know that Mandela is not a threat. Ms. Sussman, here's Mandela. He's going to run the country from within, the clerk. He's going to run the country from the world, and they're going to put his black face on it. These are the leaders of South Africa. Who chose the clerk and Mandela the leader? Did anybody say in, in, in Budalese, whether you like him or not, he represents the largest group? What about the PAC and other 25 groups? Who selected this man who can't hold on to a black wife, okay, who can't live in, who can't live in the black community and cannot give you a formula to give you the land, who, why, who selected him as the leader? That cracker and the one next to him did. He trying to select it and they're gonna try to enforce it with the gun. And we go on. You read this agreement, and in this agreement, they are going to vote for assembly. And all you're gonna vote for next year is to elect four or 800 people who will then form a constitution. So let's say we all vote next year. The Africans going to vote in South Africa. Who's going to vote? Those people, those Africans who could be registered. You know how long it takes you to get registered? You, so most of the Africans vote. Remember, there are three million whites. There are six million Africans who live in the shanty town. But they never talk about the 30 or 40 men who live on the homeland. So who's going to vote? Any of them going to vote? So what you're going to be voting for is an assembly, which will then sit down and take five years to write a constitution. Meanwhile, nothing changed. After they write the Constitution for five years, there's a five-year grace period. So what ANC is agreeing to, now guess what? No transfer of land, no transfer of mines. The police are still going to be in the military under white control. Nothing changes. And anything that is now government-owned, like airports and roads, will convert to private. So even if an African takes the control of the country, he will have nothing. And the reason they want 10 years is you know how many people they can kill in 10 years? You know how many water supplies they can kill? You know how much AIDS they can put in? And you know how much minerals they're gonna strip? That's what they is. So they're trying to get them to buy. So now the ANC says that we're gonna buy into the system. Read the documents, not what I say. Not what the ANC say or PSC. Read the documents that's coming out of these places. 
This is the woman and try to enforce it with the gun. And we go on. You read this agreement, and in this agreement, they are going to vote for assembly. And all you're going to vote for next year is to elect four or 800 people who will then form a constitution. So let's say we all vote next year. The Africans going to vote in South Africa. Who's going to vote? Those people, those Africans who could be registered. You know how long it take you to get registered? You, so most of the Africans vote. Remember, there are three men whites. There are six men Africans who live in the shanty town. But they never talk about the 30 or 40 men who live on the homeland. So who's going to vote? Any of them going to vote? So what you're going to be voting for is an assembly which will then sit down and take five years to write a constitution. Meanwhile, nothing changed. After they write the constitution for five years, there's a five-year grace period. So what ANC is agreeing to, now guess what? No transfer of land, no transfer of mines. The police are still going to be in the military under white control. Nothing changes. And anything that is now government-owned, like airports and roads, will convert to private. So even if an African takes the control of the country, he will have nothing. And the reason they want 10 years is you know how many people they can kill in 10 years? You know how many water supplies they can kill? You know how much AIDS they can put in? And you know how much minerals they're going to strip? That's what they is. So they're trying to get them to buy. So now the ANC says that we're going to buy into the system. Read the documents, not what I say. Not what the ANC say or PSC. Read the documents that's coming out of these places. This is the woman and those children. The 30 or 40,000 who are on barren land. The South African government official statement to the United Nations. Mandela knows it. Ramaphosa knows it. Clinton knows it. All of them knows it. Says that. Of all of the African children, 25% of them died before age 1. 20% died before age 5. So the South African government admits that in a country that's half a million square miles, one-sixth the size of the United States, with one of the richest agricultural areas in the world, that they kill planned starvation 500,000 children dead a day, a year. Now Mandela got his little house, Ramaphosa got his little house, but still we're losing 50% of our children, which the estimates run from 250 to 500,000 dead a year from starvation. That ain't the town killing. All that little killing in the township is what the whites are stirring up. Because you see, if I hate you enough to have people shoot up trains and cause dissension, how are we going to get together to fight him when we are fighting each other? That's what the dissension is. Meanwhile, they're killing half your children. Because most of your population is not in the Soweto, but they're on these Bantu stands, the homelands. So they're trying to use Mandela and the ANC to buy themselves 10 years. The clerk sees a war coming. He knows the fight is going to come. So he's going around to buy weapons. So every white in South Africa got five guns, they say. The clerk has atomic bombs. He just made a deal with Russia to supply him with a transport helicopters, attack, attack helicopters, transport. And of course, you know, the, the English and the French and the Jews, the Israeli Jews, they're down there training and killing. So if you think that any white country, including Russia, or Japan, who's not in on trying to hold it down because they understand when you control the middle. If you get somebody like Mandela who's going to let them strip the country of Mugabe, they're all right. But they know that the chances are they're not going to get somebody like that. So that means that you will be in instant control of the world's economy. You see what they're planning for you? Mandela says, throw your guns in the sea. They're arming to the teeth. Maybe they'll take them out first. But no, they need him to show. Here's Africa. What did the white man do? He has a war going every place. Ethiopia, yeah, we make the mistake of fighting with each other. No yeah. argument. Yeah. We have our differences. But who's supplying the massive amount of guns and stirring everything up? So finally, when Russia collapsed and one side of the African group couldn't get guns, then all of a sudden, Ethiopia, Sudan, yeah. all of these things, most of these, when you knock off South Africa, when South Africa was raiding all of these countries, this stopped. This war stopped, that war stopped, and this war stopped. The three groups that got rid of Bar, Bar was this man America back in Somalia, stripping the country for white. The three groups got rid of Bar. The three groups were fighting among themselves, trying to figure things out. The America says, look, we better get in there before they get themselves together. 
Okay? So these are the wars that white man had gone all over Africa. We go on and we only have a few more slides. Now what did happen? This war in the Sudan, Ethiopia and Somalia stopped all intents and purposes. This war here, all of these cross-border raids that South Africa was making in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zambia, and Angola is stopped because they, their backs are to the war. So the United States and the white people continue a military thrust to keep the Angolan government off guard so they can't help you in the fight here. Meanwhile, they got a war going in, civil war going in Liberia. Liberia was a colony of America. It still is a colony of America. When a group of people were fighting the war, you get the other interpretation on it, but let me give you a broad idea. They were fighting a war. What does, what does America have in Liberia? Besides having the rubber, they have one of the largest, if not the largest, CIA headquarters right there. For this part of Africa, there's a CIA headquarters. Large tracking station for satellites in a large military base. So to America, Liberia is important because of the rubber, because of the tracking station, the military base, and the CIA headquarters. So they have an interest in this quote unquote civil war. These, a group of people were winning before there was a group of West African countries headed by Nigeria who for some reason interceded on the, the side of the group backed by America that, that only was in Monrovia. Now you can figure out whatever deal Bob and Gita may have made with America to prosecute that war, to stabilize the war. And I don't know, but you gotta ask yourself the question, why Nigeria, the biggest, strongest, richest country in the world, which is supposed to be our big brother in engine, why Shagara and Deco and others, because of the lack of self-love, steal billions. Deco was the oil minister under Shagara. He ran to England with X amount of billions. He came to America and Bush Schultz gave him his green card. They tried to kidnap him to get him back to Nigeria. The English said, take the damn man, but you're not getting the money. How the hell are you going to take and squander tens of billions of dollars of your people's money, take it to white people? When you need your railroads built, you need your ports built, so we're not thinking right. Now, we go on, and what happens is now that you stop these wars, we get ourselves together, we push into South Africa. Next. Now, I just drew my own political map, just so that you can, you think about it. Look at how they might look at it in the headquarters of the CIA, because this is, you see, remember, if Lumumba would have taken Zaire and uh, Mohammed Mutala and Nigeria and others, other groups would have taken it instead of the Shagara. And you'd have some powerful countries. These countries are huge. They got millions of people. You know what kind of armies we could have had, atomic weapons we could have had, uh, trading groups and blocks. We wouldn't be scratching and hubbling. Okay, so the white man says, look, Africa being the most important, they try to stabilize Liberia make a deal with Nigeria, whatever happened. And I still have to ask why Bobby Gita and the military rulers don't want to release or make some kind of accommodation, and why, I still have to ask, did they intercede in the war? Why aren't those bombers from Nigeria bombing South Africa? Why are they bombing the other people? But I'm unsophisticated. That's the only question I ask when I make the question mark here, because instead of it being our engine, why is Nigeria moved from one of the strongest economies in the world to a $38 billion IMF uh, a, a thing? That's crippling the country. They're going backwards. Now, you know about Zaire under Mobutu, how that's serving the interests of white people. Now, take South Africa. You know about South Africa, how big it is, how rich it is in mineral. So if you can hold on to this, then you got this in your whole geopolitical plan. Then Egypt, here. Egypt is friendly to the United States. The United States has to keep Egypt friendly because they need somebody in control of the canal. Because without a friendly government in the canal, nothing transmits the canal, you can forget it. Now, where does, where does Somalia come in? So the, the thing is to hold South Africa. Use Zaire to stabilize Angola so it can help. Make some deal with Bob and Gita, whoever did it, to stabilize this place. They shouldn't have been in the Civil War. They shouldn't let them fight it. Then where does Somalia come in? You see this Bavera, that military base? Notice, whoever controls here, anything coming out of the Suez Canal, it can block anything coming in or out the Suez Canal. You see over here, 
this Straits of Hamoud coming from uh, Kuwait and Iraq and, and, and uh, what's this place, Iran, the whole oil movement. So what the United States primarily want is this military base geopolitically so that they can put the base, because remember in the Iraq-Iran war, excuse me, this Kuwait, this Persian Gulf war, Sudan sided with Iraq. Jordan sided with Iraq. So the United States look at Sudan, a black country, which is the people who run it now are Muslim. They, they, they're under the Sharia district that they call the Muslim law. They see this is hostile. So they see that it's important to get a, a control of a base here. Not only the counterbalance to the control, so what the United States did was this. They said that there was no government in Somalia, even though the ambassador to the government was sitting in the UN, what he was saying, a sister. They said that they're going to use the UN to get in there and to, and to uh, get rid of those three forces. So you got three forces in Somalia. Where regardless of what you call the government, they're there. So what the United States want to do is to knock them out and then say that Somalia has no government. The first thing they tried to do was to put Somalia under UN trusteeship, meaning that they would have been under the trusteeship of the UN, which meant America. And then what would the UN going to do? They're going to go up and down, strip the country, America's going to run it. When that didn't work, they put in, the, 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 the United States put in the forces before the three groups could get themselves together. They're all Muslims, they all racially the same, people Africans of the same group. So they went in with the forces. They knew that they couldn't stay there. So they used the UN as the guys. And what they did was they used Muslim troops from Pakistan because they're dark Muslim, Morocco because they're dark Muslim and let them go in there killing other Muslim dark-skinned people while the white man stayed on the ship giving orders. Then when the Somalis fought back and started killing the Pakistani and started killing Moroccan troops, the United States tacked us in so the Moroccan and Pakistani said, no, this is, we didn't come here for this. Then they asked the Italians to attack them. The Italians refused to attack them. To take the casualties, the United States wants to go in there and destroy these three groups. So there is no government. They can come in and minister the country under the UN and they will strip it clean. But because they're fighting back, so the, so the Italians withdrew their troops, say, I'm not fighting. The Pakistanis withdrew the troops and the Moroccans say, hell no, you fight. So that's why those soldiers got killed. So we're now the United States is sending more rangers because they can't use the black troops anymore to do the dirty work. Now it's going to be a naked aggression of the United States against them. We ended up, PAC, PAC is one alternative to the ANC, brutal agent, there are 26 groups. Don't let them sell you on the ANC. All right, all right. Here's one of the brothers from the PAC. Okay, we ended with the last five slides, and I go back to Ethiopia and your religion. Here is the obelisk in Ethiopia. Here is the Christian church, long before there was a Christian church in Europe. You see the top of the church. I'm showing you the internals. This is at Lalibala. Dr. Ben, the brother took the slides from me. I haven't been to Lalibala. Showing you the other side. Now, see the symbols? The double pyramid or the dog star, it represents the 12 hours of Horus, the 12 hours of the night. Uh, there are 12 hours, and that's symbolic when you die, you know, you come to your reckoning at 12 hours. That's what this represents, the dog star or the 12 hours of waters. And of course, what you call a swastika sticker represents one of the ancient African-American calendars. Now, you look up in the ceiling, in this Lalibala, pre-Jesus. Pre yeah. This is when Jesus was in Ethiopia in a cave and roll it before they were changing and moving to Ethiopia. You notice up in the ceiling? See the grammar there? There is no Israel there. There is no Star David. Just another one of their symbols you would take. There is the grammar there. There is the dog star taken along the Nile. A group of your brothers and sisters are in Ethiopia when they will reform another religion called Christianity which comes out of the religion of the Nile. They're going to use the same symbols that have been around them for thousands of years. There's your swastika. This is Ethiopia. Here is St. George as an African slaying the dragon. For those who are Christian, Muslims, and Jews, 
We go on. We're almost finished. There's St. George again, slaying the dragon, but again, a nice African with a beautiful apple, right? And we go to St. George in Greece. Now, if the Greeks can adapt from your religion, even still drawing the, the St. George dark, let's go on. Why can't you get a black Jesus? Yeah. There he is. Here's right. Jesus in the old right. church. Go before. They will put Michelangelo on you. Right. We come down to the last slide. Right. The last slide. There is your black Jesus. Right. What's wrong with a black Jesus and a black woman and black children? Thank you. No justice, no peace. 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 No justice,